And we are live. This is Dark Journalist. Oh, what a fantastic crowd we have out there tonight in the Ideas Room. Of course, tonight I am joined by the lovely Olivia. Hi, everybody. And uh, Olivia, it's the eye of the tiger. Mm -hmm. Rising up to the challenge of our rivals. And um, I guess Carl Weathers, the uh, Apollo Creed, died today. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a really good actor in the Rocky movies were out there. And... Um, you know, we, we certainly have rivals <laughs> in this field, and we had some an interesting time with them this week, and uh, that was the Mellon Camp, uh, not John Cougar Mellon Camp, <laughs> but uh, Chris Mellon and uh, his son, Hunter, who decided to have a flip out on Twitter. That was all very fun and interesting, and, you know, they revealed a lot of sickness and the illness that goes on there when you're behind the scenes trying to run this false ufo disclosure from intelligence agencies from that ivory tower and um i actually am going to do a, a report on that and a special update just on that i'm not going to get too much into it tonight but it, in an interesting way it does dovetail with what we're talking about tonight which is psychic airships and a deep hidden technology that's involved in what i call x technology deeply involved across the uh, aeons of time and here we are looking at it through the lens of the mystery schools and the crisscross of this technology, the fact that it went underground and the groups that went looking for it for Wheeler Woe. And uh, some of the negative aspects involved in what we call nightside forces. This is a phrase that Edgar Casey gave us, and it makes a whole lot of sense when it comes to the advanced technology that we're looking at now. This episode, Psychic Airships, the Strata UFO Nightside Forces Mystery. And the Strata device uh, is something that Rudolf Steiner put on the record, and it's based on the techniques that were developed by John Worrell Keeley, a very, very uh, interesting kind of... Uh, he really runs in the mold of Tesla, who he did, in fact, uh, communicate with and, and meet and sh cross notes with. But Keeley, a lot of his stuff has been left on the cutting room floor and underground. So oddly enough, Tesla, we, we actually know a great deal more about. But Keeley is deeply tied into the UFO mystery. And uh, even though the dates, you know, we have him in 1880, 1890s, I found a very interesting article and account from the 1870s. And um, it was through an English magazine that went through a series of their, you know, they were doing kind of like almost like a, you know, 100 year review of all the things that they've put out. I'm going to put it on the record tonight. And it's quite fascinating. I've never heard it in relation to Keeley, but it shows him developing and using UFO technology. And uh, for a crowd with a journalist there jotting down, taking notes, and I'm going to read it note for note. I found the actual text. It's from a 1986 uh, magazine in the UK, and it was a hundred year uh, anniversary edition. This thing is a mind blower. And when you get around the mystery schools and around the advanced technology, you know exactly what we're talking about. And that's what we're going to be getting into tonight. A lot of weirdness uh, in, and strangeness around President Trump as well. And uh, the latest charge from Jack Smith is that there are hidden rooms and kind of, you know, underground rooms of materials there at Mar-a-Lago. And um, this is very interesting because apparently whatever the raids at Mar-a-Lago were trying to find, they didn't come up with. And this may indeed get us into Trump and his uncle, John Trump, who figures very prominently tonight when I get into this aspect that Steiner called moral technology. This is very interesting, and um, it's a deep description of how a technology needs to be used by a group that's exercising a certain morality. That is very interesting indeed. We're going to get into that. I want to mention uh, before we go any further that in the second part of tonight's episode, which is X-Series 165, Psychic Airships, the Strata Nightside UFO Forces Mystery, um, we're going to take your questions and Miss Olivia is putting those together right now. And Miss Olivia, before I go any further, let's hear what you got out there. <laughs> Najat Madri says, I love the title psychic airships and red cap goblin says the idea of airships has delighted me since childhood. I find them romantic. Oh, absolutely. And, um, well, what's very 
Very interesting is we've touched on in a number of episodes, and it recently came up again when I was covering the Valerie uh, psychic episode of Gordon Cooper, the astronaut, who was working with um, this very interesting, talented psychic who, who was working out of the White House, <laughs> trying to develop this uh, UFO group uh, that was using psychic abilities. And I, I go back often to this talk that I had, um, some of the things that Russell Targ has put on the record about his interesting meeting with Werner von Braun and Werner von Braun saying, I need you to develop an ESP testing machine for me. And Targ saying, I can do that. That's no problem. Who's it for? And um, von Braun saying, well, it's for NASA astronauts. This is fascinating because they needed them to have a certain ability in the psychic uh, field. So, it, you know, they needed to bring that latent ability out and make it manifest and train it. Those were the people that they wanted up there. And that's a little known aspect of the whole thing. And it's also how the entire remote viewing field got rolling. In fact, um, what we know of as remote viewing field, you know, comes in in the seventies. There's a much, much older program. And if we go into UK history, um, some of the things that Emma Britton brought out about the occult brotherhood that was using her as a channel between the age of 10 and 16. Um, and she went on to, you know, form the Theosophical Society in Boston, right here in Boston, with Helena Blavatsky. And um, it's very interesting because, you know, Blavatsky was in New York with Alcott and everything, but it was Britain in Boston and her in New York, and that was the coordinated team. And uh, there's a comment, actually, that um, Blavatsky had made about Emma Britton before the split happened later, where she said she never met a, a better psychic. And it's very interesting because uh, Emma Britton figures prominently in tonight's episode as well. The psychic aspect being basically what's required for this very advanced technology to work and how the mystery schools try to keep it out of the hands of some very greedy uh, power centers, families, and corporate centers in America, and how this all figures into the Keeley story. It's going to be dynamite tonight, so get ready, and um, I'm going to open with that Trump story, actually. I'm going to read you the article. But before we go any further, Miss Olivia, I wanted to ask you, um, when it comes to everything that's on people's minds tonight, what are you seeing the most? Oh, my God, it's all over the place. Uh -huh. there's, there's too much going on, mm -hmm. right? You know? Indeed. Although yeah. I will say this. I, I was not aware of this. Mark Berger says, Cliff High has been reporting on the Vedic instructions on how to operate airships. The instructions are called yoga or how to yoke oneself to the airship in order to navigate it. That's nice. There's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, the uh, Cliff High stuff, whatever he's talking about, doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about tonight. So, uh, you know, I want to make that really clear. And um, I, I'm, I hope that uh, some, you know, there's some coherent threads that are going on out there in relation to this. Um, because I've seen a lot of stuff that frankly looks like, you know, throwing stuff against the internet wall. And some of these things are getting brought up a lot. Um, it is interesting to me, and I will say this, that I'm, I've been seeing... Um, people are very aware of this approach of war, especially with what we've been seeing with these bombs being dropped everywhere over in uh, Syria now and how they put us in this situation and kind of taking pot shots over there. And then we have to respond and retaliate in order to rescue the Biden regime. Um, we need a real plan there uh, as far as the, the Biden regime is concerned because in terms of removing it. And uh, one of the things I wanted to start the show with is all the things that are going on in the background, you know, uh, Trump rising in the polls, dominating the primaries and taking that on. Trump's administration and Trump could certainly stop our border invasion. The border invasion is going to be the number one uh, issue in the campaign. There's no way around it because you can't give up the entire sovereignty of a country. And um, it's interesting because I, I know that traditionally there's all kinds of different attitudes about this, and that's absolutely fine, but this is very different. This is allowing for an invasion of the country, and the Constitution gives you the ability to defend the United States, and that's what they're not doing. 
So um, the Biden administration has, in fact, abdicated their authority. And uh, for me, this is a, a crucial issue. And the, the, one of the problems that's come about is there's been things in the background about, for example, uh, the Trump political team offering Bobby a, you know, a closer communication, if not a VP position, but it happened earlier last year sometime maybe in April or May. Now, it's interesting to me because, um, you know, I think that these reports were true and the Trump camp came out kind of denying them because they were pretty back-channeled stuff. But then uh, something came up with Bobby where he was at a TMZ event with his wife and they asked him point blank, will you do it? And he said, my wife won't let me. It was some of the worst visuals for his campaign so far. But also it's a stupid mistake because there's no reason for the Bobby camp to be saying anything like that. They should leave all options on the table. They're a small independent campaign with a lot of heft and a lot of issues, and he's a good candidate. But the campaign is only on the ballot in two states currently, so they need as much help. And the Trump forces and the Kennedy forces together constitute a large majority of the electorate. And the idea is that both forces are going to be required in order to remove the Biden regime. Uh, so later there was some, you know, a spat between the Trump camp and the Kennedy camp. Look, that's the most ridiculous thing in the world. And the Bobby campaign needs to be going dead set after the Biden regime, which is completely corrupt. He's the person that we're trying to get rid of. That's the job that you want. So going after Trump doesn't help anything. It splits the opposition. It's the worst possible outcome. There's no possible way that that can end in anything but the Biden people getting back in. As pathetic as the Biden campaign is, if they can split the opposition vote, they can squeak through in some kind of maneuver. Or God forbid, if the uh, you know thing goes into the House of Representatives because nobody gets to 270, so I want to put this on the record because I've always been giving free advice <laughs> to the Kennedy campaign, and it's very important. When I hear him uh, talk and say that they can win with 34% of the vote, it's not true, Bobby. They, they're they lying to you in there, or somebody hasn't checked the numbers. You can't win with 34%. You need 270 electoral votes. New York is gone. California's gone. Pennsylvania's gone. You know, these are all locked up. Illinois is gone. They're already locked up in Republican or Democrat camps. There's only a smattering of states that are available and the battleground states, so-called. And those are the states where the decision of the, uh, you know, the whole thing is going to be laid out. I mean, the, the Kennedy campaign is not going to win in Florida, for example. So there's, you know, there's a realistic way to look at this. The only thing that can happen with that outcome is that nobody gets to 270. That is if the Kennedy campaign is able to pick up Michigan or, or one of those battleground states and then everybody's in it and then it goes into the House of Representatives where the Democrats with some never Trumpers will put Biden back in. That is no solution. That gets you right back to the Biden administration. The idea is everybody needs to be on board first with throwing them out. Um, and a couple of other things I need to say about uh, the independent run of, of Bobby, which is, you know, I've been incredibly supportive of the whole thing. And I know the incredible history uh, there and all the great issues that Bobby has brought forward. But th in the campaign is a different matter. So you need to, and it's actually Espensky who taught me this, you need to separate the candidate from the campaign in your mind when it comes down to it. That's what he had to do with Gurdjieff. <laughs> he actually had to separate Gurdjieff from the fourth way teaching. Um, and that was the only way he could go forward. You need to do that because the candidate's great, but the campaign is being run by people who are not geared up for national campaigns, one. And two, there's a real big problem because um, it looks to me that they're building a bridge and a platform for 2028, which is great, but it could have devastating consequences if they run and, um, you know, the Biden regime is able to hang on because there was this other independent thing drawing the throw out the bums vote away from Trump. So that that's going to have to be settled and worked out in the public electorate's mind. And um, because, you know, you really, you need about four years to set up 
for the kind of run that Bobby's trying to do as an independent. And I think it's a great idea to have a new party. And I think he's the ideal candidate for it, but it looks more like 2028 because it doesn't look like Bobby, you know, with his barely getting on the ballot in these different States is ever going to be able to make up the difference of winning, um, 270 electoral votes. You can't do it with 34%. Whoever's in the campaign spinning that it's not true. You know, the campaigns only run on electoral votes. It doesn't matter. Anything else doesn't matter. In fact, on the technical count in the 2016 election was that Hillary had more votes, right? The Democrats were able to do that. But Trump had devised a strategy for the right amount of electoral votes. You need 270. It doesn't matter if you have 34% of the vote. That doesn't do anything. You need 270. You need wins in those big states. So uh, this is very important um, you know, cause if you win a state by a large number, it's just one state, you know, it's 12 electoral votes or whatever. So, um, you know, if the idea of the campaign was to stop anyone from getting to 270, that's not the same thing. And you need to put that right on the table. So there needs to be a much, you know, a clearing of the path of the Kennedy campaign one. And I believe that starts with throwing out the campaign manager, Emeralds of Fox, Nothing personal, but she doesn't have the ability to run a national campaign. She never has before. She's a total amateur at it. And, you know, she should be able to get experience, but not as campaign manager. So um, this is very important at this juncture going into this fight. Just like it's important on the Trump side, you know, for everyone to boot Nikki Haley and all the neocons that are trying to throw up a block there. It's very important now uh, that Trump become this central nominee for the Republican party and uh, that there's some kind of alliance there between uh, Bobby and Trump, because otherwise you're going to get Biden slipping through. This is very important. And we're going to, we're going to do reports on the election going forward, election 2024 reports. And um, you know, we have some fantastic people uh, in there. Bobby would, would do absolutely great as president and is an excellent candidate. But they weren't able, because they ran as Democrats, they weren't able to switch to independence in time. It takes a long time to do it. You can't win that way. You can set it up for a 2028 win. But if you were to work with Trump for 2024, that would make a total transition because Trump can only run for one more term, in fact. And Trump will uh, observe the Constitution and stop the invasion of the borders. There's no question around that. That's the key issue. And, um, you know, the UFO issue is also key. That's another one that we're working on. But let's let's get real about this. You can't win with 34% of the votes. And the way they're, they're throwing that around doesn't make any sense. I think there should be that third-party uh, candidacy, in fact. All right, so many good things to get into. Before I go any further, Miss Olivia, you're up. Huh, Najab Madhu said, this country can't survive four more years of this, that's for sure. There's no question. I mean, I it probably can't even survive another year of this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the fact. And God knows, you know, they went from COVID to, uh, you know, the immigrant invasion to World War III. I mean, they'll just, they're going to do anything to create the chaos so that the World Economic Forum and the UN can take over the United States. That's what their goal is. And they have um, insiders, deep state insiders like Biden, like Obama and those people. They're totally in on it. And the only way to stop them is to upset the apple cart. And, you know, I know we've had uh, Trump, we had Trump in there for four years. Not everybody was happy with everything that he did, but one, he was very tough on that border. That's crucial. Two, he was great on the economy. Three, he didn't get us into any international wars. It seems like those are the three crucial issues that are going on right now. And uh, it is Trump's candidacy that's more like the answer to it. If Bobby had a viable pathway to 270 votes, then I think that would be a different story. But, um, you know, switching to independent quickly, Kucinich getting thrown out and Amaryllis Fox taking over the national campaign has changed the dynamics to make it a great thing for 2028. Really terrific, but not good if they split the anti-Biden vote and Biden, you know, Stepford Biden rolls in there uh, <laughs> and they just drag his corpse across the finish line at the last minute. Um, you know, the other thing that they're working on, uh, of course, is the Gavin Newsom aspect. There's a number of stories swirling around about that, but I think it needs more time to shake out. All right. A couple of quick things about this story. Jack Smith's case against Trump has been slipping, uh, as a lot of cases against Trump have, because that kind of legal warfare was a terrible 
mistake. And I think, in fact, it bolstered Trump's chances because everyone started to wonder, what are you afraid of? Um, you know, which is the same thing that I said about the Mellon uh, affair with uh, silencing Grush. What are you afraid of? <laughs> but special counsel questioned witnesses about two rooms FBI didn't search inside Trump's Mar-a-Lago residence. The FBI missed the rooms in their search for classified documents, said sources. So Jack Smith wants to organize another raid. Whatever it is they're searching for, classified programs, classified documents, or deeper things, and things that I believe have to do with the UFO file, I think that these rooms are important and that the types of things that Trump would know how to move that type of material around. Uh, so I, I consider all this talk when Trump comes out and he's talking about Uncle John and Uncle John Trump comes up a lot tonight in the middle of all this advanced technology talk, um, then it gets into very interesting territory because we have Uncle John being raised out of the blue with no context, really. Well, I'm giving you that context, which is something we put on the record in 2017 now. Um, and that was Tesla, Trump, and the time capsule, the crisscross of Tesla with John Trump is undeniable. But what we've put further on the record is that um, John Trump was the protege of Vannevar Bush who ran the UFO file. I'm going to put other things on the record involving him tonight, and that's going to put us in a very, very different uh, place. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show. This is X-Series episode 165, Psychic Airships, the Strata UFO Nightside Forces Mystery. We're going to take your questions uh, in the second half of the program. Miss Olivia is putting those together right now before I go any further. Miss Olivia, you're up. Wolfgang McCarthy says, get ready for your mind to be blown. It's Groundhog Day. <laughs> and Al Qaeda says, question, how does Victor Schauberger fit into this DJ? Well, that's more tampering with and trying to bring out this hidden uh, side of the technology. It's funny on Groundhog Day because the movie Groundhog Day with Bill Murray I don't know, a lot of people know this, that Bill Murray is a big fourth way uh, guy, really into the Gurdjieff teaching. And um, the Groundhog movie is based on a novel that P.D. Ospensky, the Russian uh, student of Gurdjieff and incredible author of Tertia Morganum, New Model of the Universe, really innovative uh, guy on the mystery school side. He wrote a, a novel called The Strange Life of Ivan Osakin which was all about eternal recurrence. And the idea was when you end this life, you go right back into it and you remember it. You have senses of it. And a Groundhog Day, the whole premise of the thing was based on Ospensky's um, Strange Life of Ivan Osakin. And it's also interesting to consider because, you know, guys like Murray were very, very deep into uh, Ospensky and Gurdjieff's work. There's a lot of people in public life who are associated with these mystery schools, and uh, certainly Trump is one of them. In Bobby Kennedy's background, um, his his family background, there are connections there. Um, political operative Steve Bannon is deep, deep into the Gurdjieff work. In fact, there's a whole trail that when he was in the Navy, he would make sure he was located in different ports where he could access Gurdjieff groups. <laughs> this is a guy who's, who's very uh, deep insider on that front. And we had the, the very unusual kind of uh, public piece involving um, high-ranking general. And he was there and he was speaking. This is General Flynn, who was uh, famously you know, uh, ostracized by the Obama administration. And they, they cooked up this whole phony case and Trump pardoned him and everything else. But Flynn is interesting because he gave a speech that was note for note, an Elizabeth Clare Prophet speech, uh, you know, regarding the archangels and things of that nature. So he's, he's deep and he has been seen up there uh, at the Church Universal location in uh, Montana. So, you know, the mystery school aspect, Steiner, it's very interesting, and we're going to read this tonight, said that the three quarters, over three quarters of the political system when Blavatsky got here in 1875, that she had observed by approaching the mystery schools that three quarters of the mystery schools were involved in the political process, which by 1920, 
when he was speaking about this, he said had gone up to about 90%. <laughs> so it's all secret society, mystery school uh, rule of one stripe or another, right-hand path, left-hand path, however it's described. So the war of the mystery schools then becomes a very important piece. And when we talk about mystery schools, again, the, the central thrust of the schools that we're talking about are all about moving the culture forward. So they made public mystery schools like anthroposophy, like theosophy, and the Gurdjieff work, you know, Casey's work, even elements of Golden Dawn, all of that was part of this uh, public wave of secret mystery schools, which before would be kind of underground Rosicrucian um, and the like. So there's, there's a decision in there that we need to go public. And we've talked about that decision. It was a crucial one that took place in the 19th century. And around the technology aspect, you know, there's so many questions now, and there have been for a long time around the UFO subject. We're going to really uh, touch on the UFO subject with the mystery school figures tonight, and it's going to turn up some rather dramatic surprises. Before I go any further, I want to mention, especially if you're new here, to go to darkjournalist.com and sign up for our newsletter. That is a free newsletter, but it lets you know about the incredible, and I mean incredible episodes that we have coming up for you, interviews, uh, X-series episodes, special reports, documentaries, and some very special events. I want you to put on your calendar as well the date of Friday, February 23rd, for a very special two-hour presentation right here uh, at 8 p.m. So make sure, Eastern time, so make sure you mark that one in your calendar. That is a very, very deep uh, presentation that you're not going to want to miss, and it's uh, at a very special location. With that, Miss Olivia, I'm going to jump in, but if you have okay, anything, no, go for it. Everything can wait. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Greedy Cat wants to know, what's DJ's opinion on what Buzz Aldrin saw in Antarctica to make him say it's, quote, pure evil? Well, yeah, I, when you get around Buzz Aldrin, there's all kinds of interesting things there. One, he was talking about how there was an obelisk on Phobos. That's pretty heavy. <laughs> there was that very strange time he was sitting there talking to the schoolroom of kids and one of them brought up the moon landings and he was like, yeah, well, that's because we didn't go or something. <laughs> so every once in a while you have him spilling out these kind of interesting things. But what I would say is this, when they were doing all these unusual visits, and this is something Dr. Farrell has pointed out, um, of different types of officials, celebrities, and all kinds of things going to Antarctica, Buzz Aldrin represents someone who has a great knowledge of space, has orbited the earth and presumably been to the moon. So um, this is somebody who you would call in for his expertise, even at his advanced age. And he had a, a medical evacuation while he was there. And, you know, uh, for a guy who was at that time was in his 80s um, going there, this is, this is really exceptional. I think that he even he got there, but they wanted that expertise. So they needed somebody who had been in space, who was a good secret keeper. And, uh, that's whatever it was that was going on down there. Now I've heard all kinds of rumors that they recovered a, um, a pyramid that they discovered a pyramid down there and that they wanted all these different opinions on it. The Buzz Aldrin thing though, doesn't really add up with those opinions. So you would think it was definitely space related that either they had found something that didn't add up. It was from another planet or it was an advanced craft. There is a huge wave of reports in the UFO field. And if you look for it, you can really find this, that a lot of UFO crash retrievals are supposed to be in the archeological category. I find that interesting and it makes a lot of sense with a number of things that we've put on the record here. So, um, you know, that could be what we're looking at in relation to it. Why else would you want an astronaut there? It begs the question, that's his only real expertise, you know? So, uh, it was something space related, whatever it was, in fact, yeah. And I think, you know, uh, all of the astronauts are very interesting. And it's funny because when we get into a section tonight dealing with moral technology, 
we're going to find our friend Gordon Cooper showing up again and a very interesting pact going on in the background um, that Cooper had with President Kennedy. All right, let's, um, let's read a very unusual account that I call an early UFO <laughs> account that was self-generated by one John Borel Keeley, a very fascinating inventor who lost both of his parents very early, very young, and grew up studying music and then became kind of super cosmic, scientific, mixed with musical uh, psychic. And uh, this is interesting because, again, the account now, um, the actual anniversary episode of the magazine I'm going to read from is from 1986, but it was reprinting an episode, uh, an issue of the magazine. It's called Look and Learn, and uh, it's from November 1973. Now, a hundred years earlier, this had taken place, and one of their roving reporters had been there and written down this story. In Philadelphia, um, okay, John Keeley claimed to harness sound waves, which made the curious, uh, a curious disc take flight. It was a warm summer evening in the late 1880s in the elegant city of Philadelphia in the U.S., their U.K. magazine. The rays of the setting sun were reflected from the fine pink marble public buildings set in lush green parks, but the crowd that was crammed into an engineering workshop on the edge of the city had no eye for the beauty that could be glimpsed instantly through the dusty cracked windows. A small space at the center of the workshop was occupied by a cloth-covered table. On it stood a strange machine, a complex structure. And uh, a complex structure of metal plates and tubing in the form of a disc. A long wire connected it to a staple on the table. A buzz of the conversation was hushed for a few seconds as the noise swelled up again, reinforced by gusts of laughter from the audience. It wasn't the newcomer's appearance that caused so much merriment. Obviously, of all the noise, Keeley, with a violin, took up his instrument and tucked it under his chin. Uh, then drew the bow across the strings. The first couple of notes were lost against the barrage of comments and jeers that came from the audience. So they'd come to see this kind of spectacle of this, something magical happening, this craft or whatever. And in the middle of it, John Keeley, you know, there with his craft, but he pulls out a violin. Uh, oblivious to all the noise, the noise, the violinist took up his instrument, tucked it under his chin, gazed at the ceiling for a few seconds, then drew the bow across the strings. Then uh, these sounds died away and the crowd had open mouths as a look of total incomprehension. The audience sat stunned as they gazed at the incredible spectacle that was taking place only a few feet from their eyes. For in response to a note played on the violin, the metal disc had begun rising from the table. As the note died away, the disc started to sink again before another note <laughs> sent it soaring toward the roof. Now came a flurry of short, sharp strokes, which sent it skimming over the heads of the astonished Philadelphians. A wild, unearthly tune followed with the metal shape darting and diving there, there here, there, and everywhere. In its movement, seemingly controlled by the violinist as he plucked and sawed away at the strings, after several minutes of this astounding performance, the musician played a long dying note, which slowly returned the silvery craft to its original position on the table. There was silence for a few seconds and then pandemonium broke out. The Quakers so far forgot themselves to shout and cheer. The businessmen pounded each other on the back and talked about the profits that could be made from the public display of such a disc and so on. They go into the history of John Keeley. And then one of the things they mention here is a quote from Keeley himself at this event. And he says, before I had reached my 10th year, researching in the realm of acoustic physics had a perfect fascination for me. My whole organism seemed attuned as if it were a harp of a thousand strings. Um, and there's a great kind of overview of how this kind of got Keeley in the center of developing the Keeley motor. 
and all of these very unusual devices. Now, um, there's a, a sketch in the magazine from the event, which I think uh, is a reproduction. But take a real look at this and tell me, and remember the date here, we're talking about the 1870s, right when Blavatsky is getting over to America. This basically, based on the description, looks like a small UFO <laughs> being operated there by the violinist John Keeley. Um, I've I've read of other uh, cases of him levitating objects, but it was with uh, a piano. So this violin thing and the sound aspect is kind of like any directed vibration as it were and here he is using musical instruments that so here is keely as the violinist mm -hmm. and up there uh there's a shot and of course over here is him in jail because <laughs> <laughs> they put him in jail because they were you know very afraid of what these discoveries were about and also i think it was a way to also leverage him and, and corner him now um Keeley's works brought up in The Secret Doctrine in Blavatsky's uh, incredible track there and giving us an idea of his advanced uh, technology that he's bringing to bear and where it's coming from. And the interpretation literally of what she's saying, although she doesn't put the, the exact two words together, is basically psychic technology. Now, it's interesting because... Um, there are a lot of stories about Keeley, and anytime you dig into them, you can find over and over again, they're largely substantiated. One of them is that he demonstrated uh, for the U.S. Army in at the 1880s a craft that could move somewhere in the vicinity of four to 500 miles per hour. And that uh, it's interesting how the conversation <laughs> goes in terms of the Keeley technology, because they're very worried about having this guy out there and the corporations at that period of time getting together and looking at him. What they're trying to do is consolidate the technology without him. And what's weird is um, it becomes well known that demonstrations of the technology without him there don't work. Now, there's a really interesting reason that they give for that. I want to jump ahead now to Rudolf Steiner about 30 years later, looking back at Keeley, because Steiner is going to bring all of Keeley's work around in a series of mystery plays, and he's going to develop something which is called the Strader apparatus. And uh, the this particular device is very interesting, and it forms a central place of this advanced technology in the Steiner work. And of course, the emblem of this device uh, where it shows up in the guardian of the threshold um, set of mystery plays is, has the ex as the heart of it. And I'm going to show those tonight as well. Um, for those who don't understand or haven't heard previously, Helena Blavatsky, uh, Russian mystic, incredible author, influential, founded the Theosophical Society, opened up India, and Indian mysticism uh, to the West. And um, the Theosophical Society developed a number of different people and principles, uh, including Gandhi and all kinds of uh, movements. And But one of those people uh, who was leading the Theosophical chapter in Germany was Rudolf Steiner. And Steiner um, you know, was an Austrian who had a... Uh, a genius level in terms of his own teaching, but he had gone off from the traditional kind of university of Vienna track that he was on to say, I need to take this work up and bring it to a whole new place. So he, he has this kind of cosmic awakening of his own and Steiner becomes the crucial figure in bringing theosophy up a level. And, uh, any Besant who also plays a big role in the Keeley stories because eventually the technology of Keeley's will go to Besant. 
or did it stay in Boston? I'm going to raise these questions tonight as well. But here's the thing that we need to remember about Steiner. Steiner brings through anthroposophy after he splits off from theosophy. He doesn't have a desire to split off from theosophy, but theosophy becomes the playthings for all things occult uh, at a certain point. What we are looking at with anthroposophy is the real Western version of theosophy. And um, Steiner gives his reasoning very simply, which is the Eastern schools were meant to create the foundation and the Western schools, you know, initiatory mystery schools. This is their time. They're supposed to lead. And um, there were some, you know, dissensions that were going on in that period. And so this big wave of the Eastern knowledge was coming in, which was important uh, for us in America and the UK and others to take that in as a, an impulse in this period of time. However, it wasn't meant to be that we're going to replay that aspect of the Eastern schools again. So Steiner really comes in as um, somebody who can make a series of innovations, and he makes political enemies like the Nazis. Um, and he you know, creates anthroposophy from a very small group into a very thriving um, organization and a number of things, uh, you know, like Waldorf schools and, and things of this nature come out of that movement. What's interesting to me is there in the awe that Steiner expresses and the awe that Blavatsky expresses for Keeley. And if you go just a little bit deeper with Keeley, you start to see that this is somebody who had given us a glimpse of the technologies of the future. The problem was the culture wasn't ready for it. And these mystery schools were looking at him and saying, they're going to take his technology and use it. You know, if you think this world war that's coming in is going to be bad, World War I, if they have this tech and they use it, forget it. They'll decimate each other. So there was a concerted effort to keep his technology underground that wasn't driven, you know, as Tesla's uh, energy was kept and his inventions were kept underground by the corporations. That's a totally different thing. The reason they were doing it um, on the mystery school side with Keeley was to help, you know, escape that technology from some very, very dangerous hands. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is Psychic Airships, the Strutter UFO Nightside Mystery. We're going deep tonight. And uh, as you can see there in the 1870s, John Keeley showing us basically a miniaturized version of a flying saucer being operated there for an audience in Philadelphia in the 1870s. So, um, you know, when we get into some of these understandings about the things that have been put on the record um, by a number of very good authors dealing with this period of time and uh, some of the airship groups, and uh, which you'll find in the books of Walter Bosley, Joseph Farrell, the Sonora Aero Club, uh, Teo Pymans does a great job. Uh, he's a little more cynical. But he, he's, his details are remarkable in doing it, and, and his, his work is highly enjoyable. What's interesting is they all see that something was going on back there, and the, what's missing is how did this technology just slip away? What happened to it? And the hints that are given out when Steiner is talking to crowds, he's saying, look, right now in the U.K., there are secret societies, mystery schools there who are connected with the political situation in the U.S. and the U.K., and they are developing this technology. They're going for broke with it, but they're not doing it publicly. And it's very interesting because the suggestion there is that um, the mystery schools on you know, the right-hand path side are also developing it, and there's a race in the background on this technology. So when we get into the war of the mystery schools, I talk a lot about X-Protect and X-Share on this program in relation to the UFO file. It's the same thing. It's the, the same exact thing. And you can see this play out in a number of different areas where there are groups that are attempting to use advanced occult knowledge, advanced esoteric information, advanced 
of technological information based on that and to try to you know develop it in the background and then thrust it upon the public uh, so so much of the biometric uh, digital style technology that is being you know digital id biometric id the control of every phase of your being isn't just about a kind of digital slavery but there's also an energetic slavery that's involved because they understand what's going on there runs a lot deeper this is the crucial aspect uh, i would say in relation to this so when we get to the airship part i'm focusing in on a level of technology that is a crucial piece so when you get from airships to the ufo mystery to the ufo file to the suppression of the technology to the exercise and development of that technology for a hundred years out of the public's eye and then the great emphasis on space that is a, a you know a, a terrible combination for the public on the ground to be caught unawares and by the time we get into the false rollout of the uh, Intel version of disclosure and the stuff that hits in 2017, then we know those guys are ready in the background. The breakaways, you know, the Expertech group is ready to move out their version of this, including a UFO threat. But we can go back and we can grab what the mystery schools were trying to tell us about this period and understand it a great deal better. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist show, Psychic Airships and the Strader UFO Nightside Forces Mystery. We're going to take your questions in the second part of tonight's program. And it's funny, we started off with the presidential race because Trump shows up right in the middle of this, mm -hmm. but it's through his uncle. <laughs> and... Uh, Today is kind of a little, you know, present for us. Jack Smith says, I want to know what's in those secret rooms. <laughs> well, so do we, Jack, so do we. But uh, we, we know that whatever is going on in the background there, you guys want them for a totally different reason. So um, the, the account of this story and the craft with Keeley is just, again, one of those signs and signals that the advanced technology was happening there and that flying discs were going around. And at this point, they were totally human origin. That's important too. They're using a mystery technology, but there's no ET anything to going on in relation to these reports. But that's going to be crucial because um, too much of this is uh, allocated to the ET phenomena. Um, and I don't think that we should rule any of that out at all. Um, but we can see that it's overemphasized and it's funny with the obsters because one of the things that's going on is they were whipping people into such a UFO threat mentality that they got a lot of people looking into space and I think they got nervous on the expert tech side. So they've started to roll out this thing now where, you know, they're saying everything's interdimensional, which again, you know, just like everything that goes on with these people, there's a pinch of truth in all of it. But it's funny to me that they're they're switching around with this. So you're getting these kind of weird uh, congressmen rolling up to the mic uh, who are known for like just making corrupt deals and backroom deals and things. And they're like, we're trying to find out. Stay tuned. Is it extraterrestrial or interdimensional? Uh, when you see that going on, then you know there's a shift in the background. And then you hear other people and they say, well, actually, you know, uh, what we know is that there's there might be a civilization underwater doing this. They're trying to figure out exactly what's going to sell. So there's a lot of data mining going on, perception management, trial balloons. This is the nature of it. If we understand it and come in from the level of X tech and the understanding there, then all of this starts to make sense, including the fact that Elon Musk is turning everything X. There's no question about it. We warned about that. Not as some great prophets or whatever, but what I want to do is give us an idea that the study that we do and you in the ideas room and the, <laughs> the kind of intelligence that we share on this is crucial. And you see it showing up in the world and so many people are looking around and you see the comments. They're like, where's all this X coming from? Well, if they were watching the show, they, <laughs> they'd have a better understanding. But what happens is um, what we need to 
really focus on and bring the message out of is all the stuff that they're saying in relation to this goes to the point that they have a technology operating and operational in the background that goes directly to the core of this. Another aspect of the X tech that I want to point out tonight, and I'm going to use Rudolf Steiner's concept of moral technology is they would love to figure out how to operate certain aspects of this hidden technology from their own point of view without having to deal with any of that moral or spiritual development <laughs> aspect. This is what they're all about. And they're trying to operate from a totally different level. This is where they are mining uh, people's psychic abilities and operating them there. Because if the people come in and have that psychic ability to do it, they might think we can accomplish our mission through them. Um, I'm going to describe psychic technology how it relates to the UFO file as we get through here. We need to understand it on the esoteric level and then bring it down, which is what we're going to do tonight. It's great to have so many of you here with us. Um, before I go any further, I wanted to mention to anyone who's new here, to, and I really want to get this across, which is we're under tremendous amounts of censorship levels that we've never seen. And the best way to stay in touch with us is through the newsletter, which you'll find at darkjournalist.com. And um, that's a free newsletter, but it keeps us in touch and lets you know about the remarkable shows that we have coming up for you, especially if you're new. Make sure you take that one minute and uh, at darkjournalist.com and go ahead and get behind the work that we're doing here. If you become a subscriber, you can support uh, our efforts as well. And uh, that's all appreciated. Before I go any further into the next segment, Miss Olivia, you're up. Scarlet Fire says, if you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Nikola Tesla. And Janine <laughs> says, could you please reference the building of Coral Castle and the pyramids? Isn't that interesting? You know, um, a number of years ago, someone sent me all of these little pamphlets that Leed Skeldon used to sell about magnetism. And one of the things that he said there is basically the way I built Coral Castle is I, I redeveloped, <laughs> I rediscovered the aspects that the ancients were working with in terms of the magnetic fields, South Pole, North Pole, and all these types of things. Um, but that's an incredible <laughs> site. And of course, what's interesting is it got so much attention at one point that he had to move it. So not only was it remarkable uh, that one guy could put this all together and how did he do it and all the rest. And but at a certain point, they got too curious and they try to film him and, you know, people vandalized it and all the rest. So he moves the entire thing on these trucks and the workmen have to kind of like close their eyes to see how he's doing what he's doing. And he moves the whole thing now. It's right outside of Key West and uh, it's right there between Miami and Key West and just an incredible uh, modern monument to this deeper understanding and of course, whenever you hear any of the stories about it and they talk about, oh, it was all for, you know, his girlfriend when he was 16, because he talks about Sweet 16, anyone who's dealing with an esoteric lens on any of this stuff can really research what he was talking about, because there's nothing to do with that. <laughs> but a great story, is it not? Um, okay, so what we're going to do, I want to read some of what... Blavatsky had to say about this hidden technology and what she had to say about Keeley in particular and how we can extrapolate out of that how we're dealing with this UFO phenomenon and what it might be beyond an ET um, showing up and how there's a crisscross there in our own understanding about the mystery schools, the technology that was kept, the things that were suppressed, and the forces on the surface um, the ruling structures, trying to get their hands on the powerful information that the mystery schools held. Now, um, this is something that she wanted to put on the record about Keeley, for example. And if it all, this is all from uh, the secret doctrine. If it all appears too unscientific to be even noticed, let science explain to what mechanical and physical laws known to it are due to the recently produced phenomena of the so-called Keeley motor. What is it that acts as the formidable generator of invisible but tremendous force of that power, which is not only capable of driving an engine, 
of 25 horsepower, but has even been employed to bodily lift the machinery. She's talking about levitation here. Yet this is done simply by drawing a fiddle bow across a tuning fork. Here's that musical vibration aspect that Keeley is using again, just like in the craft demonstration he gave. For the etheric force discovered by John Worrell Keeley of Philadelphia, well known in America and Europe, is no hallucination, notwithstanding his failure to utilize it. A failure predicted and maintained by some occultists from the first that he wouldn't be able to get it out. The phenomena exhibited by the discoverer during the last few years has been wonderful, almost miraculous, not in the sense of the supernatural, but of the superhuman. Had Keeley been permitted to succeed, he might have reduced the whole army. He might have reduced a whole army to atoms in the space of a few seconds. As easily as he reduced dead ox to as easily as he reduced a dead ox to that condition. On the next page, in the humble uh, opinion of the occultists, as of his immediate friends, Mr. Keeley was and still is at the threshold of some of the greatest secrets of the universe, of that chiefly on which was built the whole mystery of physical forces. So what Keeley had discovered, according to Blavatsky, was so powerful you could vaporize an army on the spot. So there was a lot of issues from the mystery school side, from the opportunist political side. Everybody wanted this thing for one reason or another. And Keeley is in the middle. He's not a rich man. He's getting investment through his demonstrations, but he's getting a lot of people spying on his stuff. And Keeley is an unusual figure in the middle of all this. He almost seems like somebody who's living in a dream. <laughs> and um, he's an incredible scientist, but um, when his work, one time some of his work was looted, they couldn't do anything with it because it was something about his own psychic force that was motivating the technology. Well, this is what Blavatsky in her work, she's you know, basically saying, this guy, he's the real thing. And um, in the middle of all this, Tesla goes to visit him, which I find fascinating. Um, I want to show some threads in the crisscross of Keeley with some of these other uh, very important mystery school figures. One of the figures in the heart of all this is Edgar Cayce. And Casey comes after Keeley and after Blavatsky, but he is kind of the heir of this breakthrough in information. And it's funny because, you know, uh, it seems like the mystery school, they start with individuals when they are going to give out and feed out this information. And um, there are individuals like the Fox sisters and the Poughkeepsie seer and all these people where they work one-on-one -on -one with them to give them insight into this other Place. So they heighten their psychic ability, give them mystery information. And those people come out to the public and the public starts to understand. When they have the great meetup and meeting of minds of saying in those mystery schools that are warring, the person who is the figure that they decide on who can kind of end all the problems is Blavatsky. And Blavatsky, in bringing her out, um, they basically are saying, okay, you know, We'll let some of the secret knowledge out through her, but she's somebody who has the natural mediumistic capability. She's one of the greatest psychics. So everybody basically agrees on that. Once she gets into that role, they do things to take her off course. Uh, schools are very upset with her. They're jealous. All kinds of things go on. And uh, they even try to prosecute her in the United States for violating the Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> which is a little chapter that you don't hear much about, but the mystery schools wanted her badly. And um, one of the things that they objected to with her in that period of time, was she's a Russian, she's a woman. That's another problem for them in that period. And um, this is very interesting because she says, well, look, you know, the mystery schools in France, <laughs> they know that I know what you know. So if you don't take me on here, I'll go over there. And not only that, I'll tell them what you know. <laughs> so uh, she kind of is very bold in her stance on this. And this is a real big problem for them. And what happens is they decide to place her 
in psychic confinement. So they use a number of different uh, mystics inside the mystery schools to place her in this uh, field of vision where when she sees a vision, there's a distortion. And so all kinds of weird things happen to Blavatsky as a result of that. But uh, she had come forward with this and Steiner in his own work said the true initiators stood at the cradle of theosophy that she found it. There's no question that they had done this and um, you know, but she was, she was a human being and she had these quirks to her as well. And the people inside those secret societies didn't want her as competition. Um, one of the things I want to say about her and the ascended masters that she dealt with <laughs> right on <laughs> like, just even looking at that image it is wow. quite remarkable and what's interesting is this is a painting and the, the person who painted it said i painted it from a photograph but they never wanted to let the photograph out so did these ascended masters just kind of <laughs> from the etheric blend in it's interesting to me on a lot of levels and what happened with theosophy was it was targeted and destroyed. You can really think of it that way. And also um, there came to be a period of theosophy where it was, they were looking at it and it, you know, the people who were working on it, suddenly everybody was dealing with an ascended master and saying, oh, I'm the one, I got the latest message from Kutumi and, you know, here's my book on it. It became, and we've seen this happen actually in all kinds of different new age movements and things, but something very special about the outgrowth of theosophy and the characters who were involved. And uh, whenever you get people involved on that level, you know, uh, you're going to have all kinds of distortions, but um, what Blavatsky brought through with the secret doctrine gives us an idea and gives us a setup for what we can understand now is the sex technology going forward. This is going to be crucial. Now, what's interesting is Steiner said, you know, the mystery schools withdrew from Blavatsky at a certain point when all this was going on. And they said, well, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to find a different channel for bringing this whole thing out. And I believe they went back to working with different types of individuals. And that's where the Casey work comes in. I believe that Casey represents the next stage, but let's go to some of the fundamentals of what theosophy and the other mystery schools and Casey and Gurdjieff are bringing out. There's fundamental information dealing with humanity's future and what it's all about. There's fundamental information dealing with humanity's hidden past, uh, Atlantis, the destruction of Atlantis, the high culture of Atlantis, the advanced technology of Atlantis. This is the awakening for the general culture that wasn't there in this kind of 2000 year or so period. Uh, by the time you get into the 19th century, suddenly it's back up again. You have, you know, presidential candidates writing books about Atlantis. So they brought it back in and there was a reason for us to be aware of this because at a certain point back in our own prehistory, we had developed an advanced technology and that technology had destroyed the main culture uh, and centers of civilization. And it also had set up a distortion in the earth that the destruction was so bad, it created an effect. And the effect I've, I've put out in relation to this is apothium. And we talk about apothium a lot on this show. But it's a distortion, it's a reality distortion physics that's a leftover from this period of destruction of Atlantis, and it shows back up through the UFO ET uh, experience, you know, that whole, all the categories around UFOs, visitations, we see this laying out again. So Casey, in my mind, is there to set up the culture and say, not only do you need to, you know, develop your psychic ability, you need to remember your ancient past in Atlantis, where this all comes from. And also we get the information about the hall of records that the Atlanteans put in, um, you know, underneath the Sphinx and in the three places in the earth. When we start to understand these characters from that level, then we can see their importance and Casey's mission it seems to me, is telling us about the advanced technology in Atlantis. 
how it was misused, and how this time it needs to be used in the proper fashion or we're up for destruction again. Um, this is an interesting mission, too, and there's a number of stories about Casey and his psychic development which are incredible, and I learn more about those stories all the time. But his abilities were uh, something that you know we've never seen. Of course, there's a number of books about all the incredible health readings that he gave in some cases, life-saving uh, information. But um, the, some, the 900 some odd life readings that deal with Atlantis, we're, you know, we're in a very, very different place from any other tradition around Atlantis. And the information is so deep and so detailed that when he gets into the Atlantean's ability, there's something that he mentions on a number of occasions that he calls a misuse of the technology, which are called nightside forces. Nightside forces are what the Atlanteans used. And when you think about it, you know, we have a certain nightside force using nuclear technology and things of this nature, highly destructive. And you can imagine those schools looking out and seeing the destructive possibility of what we might develop in the scientific era. But this other thing, it doesn't only take on the destruction of the planet, it takes on the destruction of the entire spiritual evolutionary path. So um, Casey's work comes in and describes this period of the development of the Firestone, and it's called the Two-Eyes Stone, and it creates all these power stations in Atlantis, and that it is the fight over that technology. Again, two sides, a kind of X-share, X-protect battle takes place about what the technology is for and how it should be operated. The Amelius group in the Atlantean period operating it, using it as a spiritual interface to speak to the saintly realm, the outer spheres, as Casey talks about it, and the Belial group using it to nuke their neighbors, as it were. Um, so these battles take place over a period of time and split the continent into three islands, and we get the residue of the entire story it ends there with Poseidia in the battle of the uh, Law of One Amelia's group versus the Sons of Belial. And it, it seems like a kind of a nuclear exchange of some kind, but it is the exchange of this incredible uh, two-eye power. And what we get are remnants of this story ricocheting around so that we get information about where the last major part of uh, Atlantis was, and that's Poseidia. So we get an incredible insight there given by the mystery schools through Casey and this information. That's the stage, the next piece there, giving us the impression of the technology is dangerous. Well, some of the people who come to him and they're like, well, if I can find this Firestone now, you know, this Atlantean Firestone, am I, can you give me instructions about where I can go to find it. And he says, well, if you find it, you, you may misuse it again. So he's talking about it in a very, in a, there's a currency to it as if any of us could discover it. You know, it's quite interesting the way he talks about it. He's giving us this impression of be careful what you wish for <laughs> in a sense. And this gets us around the UFO technology aspect as well. We're going to get into how this works. What I want to do is go back now to Rudolf Steiner and what he had to say about all this and how he brings out this Strader device and how that aspect is supposed to be um, a, a representation of the very intense occult technology that Keeley was going to bring out. And this is the real key if we want to understand the whole phrase, psychic airships and moral technology. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist Show. This is X-Series 165, psychic airships, Strader UFO, nightside forces mystery. We're going to be taking your questions in the second half of the program. I'm going to run through about another 20, 25 minutes here, and then we'll take your questions. Before we go any further, Miss Olivia, you're up. Uh, Nanette Christ uh, said, DJ, Edgar Casey was the guardian for a young boy, TJ, who told us he saw a Casey group levitate each other in the Casey home. Do you know that story? Fascinating. Uh, you know, this is interesting because the TJ you're talking about, I, well, I want to ask you if the TJ you're talking about is Thomas Jefferson 
the reincarnated Thomas Jefferson. And uh, <laughs> that'll be very interesting. Nanette has some fascinating stories, and we're going to get her on here to tell some of these, but that in particular is very interesting. And of course, uh, levitation is involved in a number of things. There's a, a Casey reading story about... Um, she says yes. Yes. Wow. Isn't mm -hmm. that fascinating? Well, uh, there's a Casey reading story where there's a doctor who's kind of like, you know, this rude guy. Oh, with voices. <laughs> uh, well, he is this kind of rude guy and he's, you know, wants to get through with testing Casey. He doesn't believe in it. He's kind of skeptical. And um, so one of the rules for with Casey is that when he's giving the reading, you're not supposed to do any, pass anything over his body because his ethereal body is right above him and it's, it's there and it's connected, but you can basically interrupt the flow and uh, it can have devastating consequences if while he's doing this, you pass something over his body. So that happened with this guy. And then it took 24 hours to get Casey back. That was one very tricky thing. The same guy <laughs> shows up and he is doing his, you know, impatient routine again. He has an assistant in there taking down some of the Casey readings. And at a certain point, he's talking to the assistant about moving a chair up but it looks like he's directing it to Edgar Casey, And he says to Casey, up, up, up. And Casey's body levitates <laughs> off the table. And this guy who's the skeptic is completely freaked out because he was, you know, trying to blow off Casey as a fraud or whatever. And Casey's levitating in front of him because he gave him the instructions to. So Casey, when he's in this state, is incredibly suggestible. And this is a thing that um, Rudolf Steiner put on the record which is a lot of these people who are advanced psychics like Casey, like Blavatsky and others, that um, the reason, you know, and Blavatsky was swindled so many times, you know, she was swindled out of her house in India. All, all sorts of bizarre things happened to these people. Casey, you know, was flim flammed <laughs> by his own father and a doctor who were doing readings with them. And then after the readings were getting all these horse races and, and things and gambling and Casey's walking around with migraines. So there's all sorts of things like this. And um, Steiner raises the point. He says, well, you know, you wonder how it would happen that people like this could be taken advantage of. Aren't they psychic? Wouldn't they know these things are coming? And what Steiner says, it's very interesting. He says that the development of their psychic ability requires a kind of uh, inter penetrability with the outside world so that you you don't you can't have the normal kind of distrust and things that we assume on a daily basis sometimes with very good reason in a day-to-day -day activity they are at a level where they need to literally interpenetrate with the world so it leaves them vulnerable and i've seen this with people with psychic ability uh, so many different times and uh I found that particularly interesting. And he actually said that it's, you know, the, the buffer that exists between someone and the public on an ordinary basis is removed when you're at that height of a mystic level so that you are directly interpenetrating. And so you can achieve a great number of things by removing this buffer, but it leaves you vulnerable as well. And um, that is maybe something that's important to check in on when you're psychic. <laughs> Hello, psychics out there. You probably uh, know about these things because it's happened to you. Can I, can I interrupt you? For yes. Second? Oh yeah. So did anybody ask Casey how it was that his body started to levitate? What the science was behind that? Um, I, you know, it, it seems like, no, a no I don't think, I don't think anyone asked him, but I mm -hmm. can say this, that um, Casey, said that there were a number of things that we could do as individuals. The question is how? Oh, well, I'm sure that it exists. The electromagnetic ability exists inside there, the body so to do a number times, of things. There's so many missed opportunities in Casey reading. <laughs> so like, it's right there. Ask the question. Ask the question. They don't ask. I would say it's interesting. Um, you know, we've, we've seen it and with saints and, you know, there are all these stories. There's a level like with yogis you know, and fakirs and things, lying down in a bed of nails and nothing happens, walking on hot coals. 
<laughs> and, um, you know, for a while it became like a pop thing. You know, it's like, Hey, you're going to walk on hot coals with Tony Robbins or oh. something. And, uh, so we have that ability in there. Although I have to say probably, you know, a lot of those kind of quick setup things don't work out very well. Just like I've been hearing a lot about ayahuasca tourism, you know, <laughs> look, ayahuasca would be a very deep practice. You're talking about, you know, entering into the psychedelic realm. I don't recommend it at all, but I know incredible people who've done it, like Graham Hancock, who's done it hundreds of times. But um, the last thing in the world you would do is like, you know, hit up <laughs> an Amazon shaman for a weekend to <laughs> do ayahuasca. I mean, come on, you know, this is really, talk about taking your psychic life in your own hands. That's a terrible idea. Well, um, it can go badly. No shade on <laughs> Amazon shamans. Okay. I want to say a couple of things about Steiner here, and then we're going to have him comment on Keeley, and I'm going to bring this around to the UFO file technology and the fight that we're on, which we even saw in the skirmish that we had with Mellon, because I want to tell you that Mellon is somebody, and there's a lot of people from that team, it's not just him, who is very involved in trying to bring out this uh, version of the technology and they're, they're bringing it out. They need a kind of a false story to go with it. And uh, those, those are the people that are working on it. And their reasons for doing it are profit-driven, they're control-driven, and ultimately um, the foundation of what they're portraying is a lie. So that's why those, you know, they might seem like dust-ups on Twitter or whatever. But you can see when um, Mellon went after me and my work and went after uh he went after uh, john greenwald from the black vault later he kissed up to him because he was afraid of getting too many people ticked off <laughs> all at once and then he went after john warner it's quite interesting because um this gives us a lens and i want us to approach this on a practical level because there's a gigantic mystery level to it but just on a practical side there are people who are naturally ex-chair when it comes to this advanced technology and the UFO file. Warner, and with his background, with his dad, uh, who was part of the Majestic Group, who held the technology, you know, um, he he's a natural. Uh, his dad was not about sharing it with the public. I'm not saying that, but he, he Warner is. He's he's very very dedicated to that. Those people inside. Um, on the Chris Mellon side, they're connected deep into that same, you know, a different political and uh, banking structure through the Mellon banking family. They want it and they want the technology and the portrayal of the technology for a totally different person uh, purpose. That is, they, they have identified with the X-share, uh, X-protect aspect versus the X-share aspect. So we saw it even in that weird battle that was taking place on Twitter this week and the kind of bizarre movements of Chris Mellon sending his son out after he'd blocked everybody like, you know, protect me and <laughs> all the creepiness and the weirdness of that. And the son being like, you know, this proto DIA agent uh, who was just, you know, sloppily wandering into these conversations and, and trying to um, get a reaction and trying to create doubt and distract from the fact that his father was intimidating the UFO whistleblower, David Grush. And Grush told me, you know, the reason that he can't tell the truth basically was because Mellon, there were repercussions there ready for him. So that, that is the nature of the thing. And that's the question that I put to Mellon, you know, and here am I, this lone outpost, right? <laughs> putting it up there to billionaire DOD uh, Intel official UFO file uh, holder Mellon. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because his reaction was not, um, you know, this didn't happen or anything like that. It was all just a weird flip out and then blocking and then sending his weird DIA son out. Very, very strange. But you can see again, the X protect X share thing, it's 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 there. It's there on the microcosm and it's there in the macrocosm. And we see it on all these various different levels. And I operate in that all the time. And whenever you get around the lie, the deception around the false disclosure UFO file, you get this weird freak out, even at the top, even those people. 
because they're they're worried. And um, you know, I'll go into it in one of my reports coming up, but I've prepared a certified letter for uh, the Speaker of the House and for um, Burchett and Luna. I've actually sent them information regarding uh, Mellon's intimidation of the UFO whistleblower Grush, which he related to me. The stuff is real and you know we can discuss it on the large scale and then sometimes you see it in action. But that clash uh, for me with John Warner telling Mellon's son, you know, how he, you know, really didn't understand this at all and was being sent out as an attack poodle by his dad and how sick that was. That was a moment. And I can tell you that I have never seen <laughs> in my life in dealing with this, and I've been dealing with the UFO stuff for a while, I have never seen anything so low as this guy sending out his weird DIA kid to try to cover for him and his own, uh, you know, misdeeds, intimidating Grush and trying to control the UFO file. That is low, low, low action. So, uh, you know, I've put it on the record and there'll be reports on the scrutiny around the UFO file. Look, at the end of March, they're coming up with another UFO Congress. They're going to roll out uh, Grush for that. This is all a sham. If the UFO whistleblower can't talk because of the influence of a billionaire DOD official, it's not, there's nothing even close to disclosure in that. It's a sick thing. The whole thing of the UFO file disclosure aspect grinds to a halt because of Grush saying to me, Mellon, you know, I can't say anything with you. I can't appear with you. I can't talk honestly, take tough questions because Mellon, there's repercussions ready for me. That's the fact. That's a sick situation. How can you get this guy to do anything about taking on the government or the UFO secrecy when he's controlled uh, by this creep? You know, so those are the facts. And so we, we run into the X protect X share situation on a day to day basis. And trust me, you know, this week you could see it crisscross Chris Mellon. That's real X protect stuff. John Warner. That's a X share. You know, those are the mentalities. I mean, it plays out in larger structures in the background and everything else, but this is really what we're talking about. So sometimes, hey, you know, it comes out in just a day-to-day -day incident or in a fight on social media. It's the same thing. It's, it would be like reviewing the letters of Madame Blavatsky in 1865 and looking to see those little dots in the background. All right, before we go any further, you're up. Well, this is really interesting i was unaware of the um rwandan genocide and uh sonic weapons used interesting um had yeah. you heard anything about that well i'll tell you that um there are a number of technologies that are exercised whether it's sonic technologies um we hear about the whole thing about havana syndrome and all the rest these things are out there and they're not being covered because we don't know what they are and the traditional mainstream media has no interest in drilling down the source either. So uh, you're going to see a lot more of that advanced warfare going on in the back. But um, that is interesting. There's no question about well, it. Well, we All saw right. this in Star Trek. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no question about it. All right. Uh, Steiner, I, I put this on the record in relation to Rudolf Steiner, and I think it's important. Uh, I, I want to say before we go any further, if you're new here, Go to darkjournalist.com, <laughs> sign up for the newsletter. That is a free newsletter. It keeps us in touch. We have incredible levels of censorship going on. You wouldn't believe the stuff that we deal with <laughs> in terms of being delisted everywhere. Um, but it doesn't matter because as long as we have that one-on-one -on -one communication with you, that's our direct pipeline. And we can send you that newsletter and let you know everything that's going on, including the shows we have coming up, special reports, documentaries, things you're not going to believe, uh, guest appearances, and um, events. So you, you're going to want to stand up and be counted. Make sure you're on that newsletter list. It's all at darkjournalist.com. All right. So we'll get through the Steiner section for like the next 10 minutes, and then we'll go to your questions. Fantastic. All right. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist X Series 165. This is Psychic Airships, the Strader UFO Nightside Forces Mystery, taking your questions shortly here and really uh, taking on the figure of John Worrell Keeley and the UFO technology through the mystery school link. 
this is the crucial part. This is what's left out. This is the missing chapter. And it's all here. It's there right in front of us if we're able to bring it forward and interpret it. And ex-degonography is in the heart of it. We've told you about ex-degonography. We've put it on the record long before they rolled out, uh, you know, Elon and X and all the disease X and everything else that they wanted to do. And um, the reason I think that this is crucial for us to understand is they have a level of technology and they have a naming mechanism for the technology for moving it through government agencies that allowed them the ability for years to communicate about it without letting everyone in on it. That's how steganography works. If you see something that's in the open, but you're initiated into what it represents, then, you know, the public would miss it completely, but for you, it would have a high significance. This is how, they could have the CIA working on something and not have to brief 20,000 agents at a time and say, this is what ex-steganography is, it represents this advanced technology. Those agents don't need to know any of that, only the top director. What they can do is say, we have a steganography, we want you to follow. When it goes into these different areas, name it X, label it X. When you're using, When they're using this kind of technology, if that technology goes into a black program, when it resurfaces, attach the X to it, because that's how we're going to basically cover it. And um, so we're seeing this come to fruition in the middle here. And uh, what they've been doing is having the government role of Elon Musk kept very quiet. So Musk is, you know, out there with SpaceX. He's trying to push the X thing. And they're moving him into this kind of private enterprise role. But in fact, the government partnership with Musk is dramatic, and we can never forget that. You're dealing there with someone on the level of a Howard Hughes operating with the government hand in glove. There's, there can't be any way to do it. There's no other way to operate the things that he operates without that uh, association. It doesn't make him evil. <laughs> it just makes him someone who's working directly with the government. So the idea of you know Musk coming out there and being like, I'm you know in love with free speech and all this stuff, I hope it does some good, but uh, for me, you know, it's very clear that he's part of this different groups rolling into the future, the consolidation of the culture, the centralization of the culture. And um, what I would say is that the obsession around X with Musk and rolling it out at this point is he's right on time because the UFO technology that they're trying to push from the Expertech side is something that they want to roll out into the public. And so they're keeping him off of that UFO turf because one of the things they need to say to him is don't mention anything, especially UFOs that you see out there in space. You're not authorized to, to, to do that. And in fact, when you see him in interviews and things, he'll be like, oh, I've never seen aliens. There's no such thing. Well, it's interesting because <laughs> I hear from a lot of people in the background that he's he's obsessed with the subject and he is seeing them all the time because of when you run SpaceX, that's what's going to happen. So they're keeping him quiet on it because he's not part of that. They don't want people looking at space, remember. They want them to be dealing with this anomalous threat from somewhere. And they haven't decided where they are going to have it come from. This is important. Um, I think it is also crucial for us to understand is that somebody like Musk, uh, his mystery connections are pretty well hidden, but there's no question that he and his family are directly related to a mystery tradition. There's no doubt. If you're using the ex in that level, you're plugged in. <laughs> and, um, you know, so he's just the focal point for them. At this point, you know, there's a number of people that represent this individuality that we know as Elon. So that's a, a good thing for us to keep in mind. That's ex on the ground, you know, as we're running it. Yeah, what do you got? Sorry, um, Chuckle says Musk uh, on a podcast did. He absolutely doesn't believe in ETs. There's no way that <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> no, I mean, when you have access to SpaceX cameras, you're going to see UFOs all over the place. So you know, maybe he doesn't think they're extraterrestrial, but he's seen UFOs. Uh, I have no doubt about it. Um, <laughs> one of the weird things that Grush told me is that he's he's into some kind of weird moon meditation cult. I have no way of verifying that, but I thought it was funny. Musk it came is? Up. Yeah. How would he know that? 
He knows people who knows Musk. Okay. Yeah. And he said that Musk was really into Moon it. Moon meditation? So. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. We need to research that. <laughs> um, Rudolf Steiner, look, I've said this. Steiner, I believe, spent four decades trying to make us aware of Armon and the Armonic threat that could come through the technology. Armon, the dark astral force that was going to be so prominent in our century, a century before Steiner was looking out through his genius crystal ball and saying, uh oh, <laughs> this is what's going down. Um, Steiner, like Casey, had a number of encounters um, that were supernatural in his younger years, and it disturbed him greatly. They didn't understand him when he was growing up. What's funny is he becomes such a genius, but when he's younger, he's a terrible student. Um, as was Casey until he started to sleep on his books. And then when he would sleep, he could memorize every detail that was in the book. Well, what kind of ability is that? Well, in, uh, in Steiner's case, he became an excellent student after working with a geometry teacher. I find that interesting, but when he was younger, um, he expressed all these very unusual abilities he could see the future, he could see dead relatives, and he had a very unusual uh, and disturbing relationship with that world. What happens is someone comes into his life who is an illiterate gardener, and supposedly he's just a regular guy or whatever, but it turns out that he's connected with the mystery schools, and he tells him, the things that you see, don't be afraid of them, don't run from them. You know, they're real, but you just have the ability, and you can help, actually. In one of the cases, um, Steiner is in a cabin. His parents tell him to go bring these logs up to this cabin. And he goes there, and um, he sees this woman, and she's talking to him, and he thinks it's you know like an older relative or somebody, and she disappears into this stove. So he's, he's having these weird apparitions about it, and what he learns is that uh, he had a relative who died very unexpectedly up there, and this is the woman that he's seeing when he's younger. So um, balancing these strains was a difficult and interesting thing. And this Felix the gardener who comes in <laughs> uh, is an unusual character and plugs him into that, you know, and tells him, oh, you know, this is going to open up for you. And he has this kind of spiritual awakening in his 20s and he realizes, aha, this is what I'm here for. Um, and it's fascinating with Steiner because he wants us to understand the level of mystery school and secret society control going on. And he's trying to put things out. And he says, you know, at a certain point, there are some things that if I would say them, I would be attacked on the spot with such a psychic attack, it would be overwhelming. So he understands that he's being watched closely. And what he does is he starts at first, uh, including Aramon in his private groups. And that as he sees the drums of the Armonic forces uh, and the war coming forward, at a certain point, he decides, I'm letting all my notes out, like every, all the lectures and everything. <laughs> I'm going to publish everything. And um, he's, he's saying, you know, that secrecy is really a relic of the past. We, we don't need secrecy anymore. As a matter of fact, at the end of his life, he's approached to create another kind of version of the Rosicrucian Brotherhood. And he talks with them, and he says, you know, well, you don't understand with the mystery knowledge. This is great, all the knowledge that you have and everything else, but this, the secrecy part is antiquated. It's not the way that things will go forward here. There's another, there's an entirely different spiritual science that we can follow on this. Now, there are great hints in uh, his mystery plays. I mean, there's great books with Steiner outlining everything around the spiritual search. Uh, knowledge of higher worlds, occult science, a number of different fascinating books. But the mystery plays are different. And I often say that a lot of these characters from this mystery world, they are um, five people in one. <laughs> and you'll find them showing up as having this profession, you know, and they're astronomers, they're archaeologists. Hey, you know, look, they're, they run coffee factories. <laughs> like, they're politicians. Like, what is going on? How is this one person doing so many things? Steiner is exactly like that. But one of the very interesting roles he enjoys is writing under a pseudonym 
reviews of plays. And uh, he is like a leading reviewer of all of these plays going on in Germany at the time. <laughs> and it's fascinating. What he does is he creates a series of mystery plays. One of them, the portal of initiation. Uh, it opens up all of these different ideas about Armand, Lucifer, and Christ. And the struggle of the modern individual against it. In one of these plays, in uh, the third play, which is all about the guardian of the threshold, which is this very intriguing character and gives us a hint as to why the technology in question needs to be operated by someone with a moral uh, authority. Um, and this gets very interesting because the uh, I wanted to find, here it is. This is the seal of the uh, Guardian of the Threshold mystery play of Steiner's, and it is ex steganography complete. <laughs> and he's giving us the hint. This is the one that includes the Strotter apparatus, the mechanism, the advanced technology. It's right there in the heart of the X, and Steiner gave it to us. Here's what he has to say, and it touches on the... Uh, Strader device, and it touches on Keeley and the fact that the figure of Dr. Strader in the um, Guardian of the Threshold mystery play is actually Keeley. And the device has to do with the material that was sent, hidden away in Boston, of Keeley's advanced technology, thought to be sent on to Annie Besant of the Theosophical Society in the UK or buried deep in a warehouse here in Boston. Quote, firstly, there are the abilities of the so-called material occultism. Through this ability, and this is precisely the ideal of the British secret societies, certain social forms that today underlie industrialization are to be placed on a completely different basis. Every knowing member of these secret society knows this circle that one can simply set machines and mechanical devices and other things in motion on a large scale through certain abilities that are still latent in humans today. He's referring to psychic abilities, but which are developing with the help of the law of synchronous vibrations. You can find a small hint in this, which I linked to the person of Strutter in my mystery dramas. Today, we have reduced our facilities to the physical plane, if a moral culture does not accompany the culture on the physical plane, the physical achievements will have a destructive effect. We've seen a lot of that. By developing morality, man will be able to generate completely different forces than those which are now set on the physical plane. Here is Steiner talking in 1918, right in the heart of World War I. By developing morality, man will be able to generate completely different forces than those which are now present on the physical plane. Keeley set his engine in motion through vibrations that he excited in his own physical organism. Such vibrations depend on the moral nature of man. This is a first ray of dawn for that what will emerge as the technology of the future. In the future, when we will have machines that only start moving when the forces come from people who are moral. Immoral people cannot then set such machines in motion. Purely mechanical mechanisms must be transformed into moral mechanisms. This moral technology is based on a further development of mechanics, which, as indicated, large mechanical force effects are generated solely through the focus in harmonious harmony of vibrations. And he goes on to discuss how so much of this is found in latent abilities inside our own physical bodies. It's not the outpouring of a device. It comes from us. This is very important. Right now we're stuck in a situation where you get the next technological update. You're zoomed into your phone, zoomed into your laptop. These are all great tools and great aids. But the idea of you as the innovation how does humanity advance or achieve? Not just by using advanced machines. You as an individual need to progress and spiritually evolve. 
That's the only real evolution. Everything else is trite by comparison. Um, the use of destructive forces of subnature, electricity, magnetism, nuclear forces, through which humans can very easily fall under the servitude of the harmonic double, which are physio physiologically related in particular to our nervous sensory system, is possible. Um, now, what's interesting is he's giving us a hint there that not only do we unleash this kind of destruction through having the wrong people in charge of advanced technology, but it's being, you open the door for this harmonic force. Now, Armon is part of the cosmology. Uh, we've done shows on Armon, uh, and some of the best shows that we've done on them are with Gigi Young. But I think that between the, our efforts here in the X series and the work of Gigi Young, everyone in the space has a much better grasp of Armon. I'm not saying that they know what to do with it, um, but what I find very interesting about it is it's very hard to study and then imitate uh, things about Aramon. It, it requires a certain type of skill to talk about it properly. And so that's why you know the work of Gigi Young is, is such a gift in this regard too, because we get an incredible overview on that side. What I've tried to do with the X series episodes around Aramon is say, look, Steiner's using this name. Steiner's right at the heart, the nexus of the mystery schools, bringing it out. Why is he using Armon? Armon is a Persian evil deity. He is the evil incarnate. Um, why doesn't he just say satanic, you know, influence? There's something strange going on here. He's giving us a bigger view of the whole thing. He's saying that this harmonic force, which has tied itself into Earth's progression, is particularly highlighted in the 21st century advance into technology. And he gives us a blow-by-blow blow that, coming from a guy who's writing 100 years ago, is quite dramatic. <laughs> How do you even get to a point where you can read out the things that are going on right now? Well, these beings are going to create a web around the Earth? I mean, it's quite... it's. You know, the insight is incredible. But in any case, I think how you could look at Armon is in the anthroposophic um, cosmology, Armon is basically this low evil astral force which is attached to Earth's development, and he's kind of a, a challenge to be overcome. However, if Armon overcomes humanity, then we don't spiritually evolve, and we get locked into the system of the eighth sphere, um, which we've done a number of episodes on. Fundamentally, the eighth sphere is a virtual reality kind of AI prism where you project the things and you think that you're living when something is, is basically living off of you. So when we understand these as the roots of what Steiner is bringing forward about Aramon, then we start to look at that in relation to how the technology now, the whole thrust of it is to basically split you off from your spiritual understanding. So the harmonic thing is no spirituality, you're purely into the scientific materialism. And that's what we see happening with people relying more and more on the technology. Now, I want to say, and everybody knows this who watches the show a lot, you know, I'm really into technology. I ran a technology magazine for 10 years. So, uh, and I, I know from being in that world, what, what it's about and the what drives the people around that. It can be very interesting. So it's not an anti-technology thing, but we have to understand the dangers involved. And it goes far beyond the physical destruction aspect. You know, when they talk about, well, we're leading ourselves to a kind of a nuclear destruction. I think this is actually very old terminology. I think that the weapons and the things that we have now far surpass since probably the early 1990s, anything that nuclear could do. But um, I, do I do think of it this way. What we need to understand is that this is a, an electromagnetic uh, move into your energy sphere. So the power of Aramon is not just to trap physical life, it's to trap the soul life. That's the danger. I remember 
Um, and you can see this in the mystery plays. I highly recommend Steiner's mystery plays, but he talks about when he's working on the sculpture of Armand and how he feels himself encased in a kind of concrete. And he has this realization of Armand basically wants to turn the world into a gigantic deep freeze. His state is heavy. It's heavy laden. And he has to be careful when he's tuning into him because his own body is going under the weight of this thing. So it's a, you know, there's a kind of a, a dross that's involved with Armon. It's a heavy weight on humanity. And what Steiner is trying to do when he's looking out is saying, how can I give these people coming into the 21st century knowledge about this? And so he gives us Arma. Um, I don't think that that's arbitrary by any stretch of the imagination. And of course, the sculpture that he does, it does stick with you. I mean, you know, this is his impression. Certainly looks like the devil. Now, um, what he's saying is we need to encounter this being and overcome it and use that knowledge for spiritual evolution. And the only way to do that is to be aware of its incarnation, which is happening sometime in the century, probably very soon. Um, so early in the 21st century, here we are. <laughs> so that's, you know, I, I wanted to really give a little background on that because when we're speaking about Araman, as we're going to here, we have to know what it is we're talking about. Um, now, the uh, there's a description of this Strotter apparatus. I want to show this thing. First off, these are Steiner's notes on it when he's giving it to this artist, Oscar Schmiedel, to develop. And he tells him, I'm going to be giving you a metal that isn't known. <laughs> so basically, be careful with it. So an unknown metal is part of the uh, structure. And the image of the structure, when you look at it, is supposedly based directly on what Keeley was using for all this levitation of disks and things like that. It looks so very unusual, and you think to yourself, what is he trying to get across? Well, he's using this as a model for the plays. So some of it's symbolic. But there it is. That's the actual Strader apparatus. And here's what he has to say. Um, here's what the artist who developed it for Steiner had to say about the instructions that he got. Let's do that next. Steiner gave the models for Strader's study in The Guardian of the Threshold in great detail to me. Even mentioning the metals to be used, they were first made very provisionally in 1912 in my first Munich lab. Due to the haste, the following winter I had made, I had them made, including the material, according to Steiner's instructions. They were used in the Guardian of the Threshold in 1913 and were also spared in the Gertianum fire because for some reason they were not in the Gertianum that night. Now, anyone who knows that anthroposophical history is that the Gertianum is this incredible building that Steiner puts together and that the Nazis torch. But the idea that this model of this advanced technology piece is spared is very unusual. And some people have raised the idea that the, this is what the Nazis were after, that they heard Steiner was tampering with an advanced technology piece and they went in there to find it and torched the place when they couldn't. It was impressive how precise Steiner's information was. One component was even supposed to represent a metal or substance that had not yet been discovered. It is difficult to say specifically what purposes these devices were intended for. The central apparatus seemed to me to be something like a capacitor for collecting rays and effects flowing in from the cosmos, perhaps also a transformer of these. Various metals, copper, nickel, uranium, pitch blend were used, also a surrogate for the previously undiscovered substance mentioned above, which was supposed to be colored blue. If you watch the Blue Enigma, you get a kick out of that one. In addition to this central apparatus, several other things were specified. A hollow copper hemisphere hung on the wall. The inner side faced the central apparatus. Another device perhaps represented a kind of measuring instrument. 
He also mentioned when Strader's invention would be realized. This was in the not too distant future. Unfortunately, I no longer remember those dates. Um, you find that when he talks about this again, that Steiner had mentioned this as part of the 100 year interval, this device or this level of technology is supposed to be brought into the public sphere sometime around the period that we're in, well, 2018. Uh, so, you know, the, here we are six years after. Strader apparatus, which is described in Rudolf Steiner's mystery dramas as an invention of Dr. Strada, is intended to provide an indication of a modern technology to be developed in the future, which is not like currently used machines based exclusively on energy consuming physical forces, but rather potentially free etheric universal powers. Uh, and it's Strader's intention to, you know, bring this kind of advanced technology to the public and something goes terribly wrong in this rollout. This is very much like the Keeley story. This is what Steiner is giving us in the Guardian of the Threshold mystery play. It is the rollout of Keeley's technology and how it would happen again. There'd be another window again in a hundred years. Um, this thrust of the advanced technology that Steiner is giving us, that Blavatsky is laying out there, they're trying to tell us that there's something else um, that's operational. And somehow uh, the moral technology aspect is the people who are operating the technology need to be of a certain character to operate. This is why the deep state and Exprotect have so many problems reanimating the UFO file piece and why they recruit psychics and everything else. This is such a crucial piece for us to realize, which is the people who are operating these things in the deep state. Um, you know, it's quite strange because there's even an allusion to a men in black type situation directly connected with Keeley's technology later through the figure of HP Lovecraft. I'm going to tell that story and then we're going to take your questions. Everyone, you're watching <laughs> the Dark Journalist X Series 165. This is Psychic Airships, the Strader UFO Nightside Forces mystery. We're going to take your questions here momentarily. Before I go any further, Miss Olivia, you're up. I really, I can't wait for the next section. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, oh, there's a lot of stuff here. Viking says, Steiner is frequently on the mind with all this deeply concerning Neuralink drama. Can Daniel better explain the difference between Aramon and Lucifer? Matty Mosef says, could Armand be the collective immorality of mankind, the sin sludge that attaches itself to us and is something like a generational curse? Katie Cat responded, that would be an egregore. Can you clarify some of this? Oh, well, those are all really interesting questions. And uh, let me tell you, the Armonic piece, it's interesting. If you want to go really deep, is a period where the uh, the moon is still inside the earth. This comes about in a lot of mystery school literature, and it's referred to by Gurdjieff as a kind of period of madness, and how, as a result, we developed something inside of us called a kunda buffer, which is kind of a block, a screen against reality. Um, in Steiner's work, that period, humanity's at its most vulnerable. And that's when this harmonic force slips into us. And it slips in physically, and it becomes part of Earth development. Now, um, there's something strange about all this, which is in Steiner's description, Armon has been trying to take over since Atlantean times. And... Um, he has wound himself up with our own evolution and basically desires to play God. So in the cosmology that he has around Araman, it has set up its own cycle of reincarnation. So ordinarily in mystery school traditions, we leave this realm. We go through the various planets of the system in uh, learning. They're kind of like schoolrooms in different types of bodies that are appropriate to those environments. You know, they might be etheric bodies. And you come back to Earth with all that knowledge 
and you apply it here. And then, you know, in Casey's work, the doorway out of the system is Arcturus. And then you're into your next level of spiritual psychic development. In this piece, what you get is that Araman has set up this eighth sphere. It's like a false version of that planetary structure. So that people would live and die in this coarse condition. They're already in a kind of virtual reality on earth. And then they go into this thing instead of the normal reincarnation cycle, they come back and they've gone through the eighth sphere and they come back and they are controlled. They become more and more coarse and more and more cut off from their spiritual life. That's the threat of being, you know, asleep to the harmonic influences. So, um, I think that's how we need to think about it, which is that the forces that control humanity outside of its own spiritual development want to keep controlling. They don't want us to advance. And so if they cut off that advancement, which is the next stage of our own spiritual evolution, they can play this game forever. <laughs> um, but Steiner has certain kind of interesting things to say about Araman, which is that he always aims at humanity's head. I find that interesting. Um, that's one piece. The other piece is that when people go into the eighth sphere, they disappear. You know, the eighth sphere is also seeing from that clairvoyant level what it is. Um, so it's somewhere, you know, in the sketches that Steiner does, he has the eighth sphere right outside the moon between the earth and the moon but it's not the moon and it's not the earth it's this other thing it's an artificial doorway and um in fact he said it was one of the greatest secrets of the mystery schools and it was very casually and strangely let out um by a theosophical writer you know before steiner was even on the scene and so blavatsky goes in and tries to play clean up on this and put the genie back in the bottle and uh, A.P. Sinnott is the author, and he gets it wrong. The way he describes it is a physical location on the moon. So um, that back and forth, and Steiner talking to us about the secrets of the mystery schools and talking about the eighth sphere, he, he was basically saying, look, the mystery schools don't even want to talk about this stuff, but since it's out there, I'm going to address it. So I think that tells us a great deal about um, what, we're, what we're dealing with on this front. Um, but those are all kind of good interpretations. I want to say this, um, which is interesting too. There's a story there about all of these controversies around Keeley and his development of this motor and all of his technology. And when he dies, uh, you know, the funding gets pulled, all kinds of weird things happen to him. They're trying to pressure him to give up his secrets. And when he dies, his partner is left with the task and he leaves Philadelphia in a hurry. And what he does is he goes to Boston and he goes to a warehouse where all the Keeley experiments and the Keeley equipment is assembled. And the story is that he ships it off to Annie Besant in the Theosophical Society who puts it underground. <laughs> it's just like humanity can't deal with this, apparently. Everybody wants their hands on it. And uh, they do grab the partner and try to force out of him, where did you stash this? Where is this stuff? We want it. And this is the greed of the structure. They are trying to get their hands on Keeley's info. There's another story, though, which is he didn't have time to ship it off to England and that they took everything from the warehouse, moved it to a location in Boston. So uh, a lot of the interesting things and stories around Boston uh, and some of the high level individuals around here, you know, there may be a very interesting reason for believing that story. Um, but here is a description of what was spirited away and why it was so dangerous to the establishment, why they wanted it so badly. So, um, this is a writer named Kiro who's in the period C H E I R O. Um, and he talks about this advanced technology that Keeley left behind and how it was worked with by different groups after the fact of Keeley's death. 
A fascinating prospect unfolds about one of Keeley's devices being shipped to England, but we must not forget that Kiro's memoirs. Uh, oh, this is all. This comes directly from Kiro's memoirs. So I'm going to read that part. Um, quote: The unexplained metal rod was found dangling from the ceiling of Keeley's workshop. Near the window was a curious-looking couch covered with copper, insulated with glass feet. At the head of it lay a compass showing by the position of the needle that the couch lay north and south in a direct line with the magnetic current on a table at the side. I noticed that... Uh, it was north to south on a direct line with the magnetic center. On a table at the side, I noticed a helmet of copper and a copper head, a copper hand. Uh, I'm sorry, a copper band. <laughs> so let me read that again. I noticed a helmet of copper and a copper band so constructed to go down the spine with two arms from it to go around the body and terminate in a 12-pointed magnet at the solar plexus connected to the center of the helmet an insulated covered wire through which open windows to a series of copper wires hanging from the edge of a high roof a few feet above the ground there in their turn were joined to an aerial of immense height over the house he's seeing a large-scale craft the copper plate of which my feet would rest was connected to a wire which was passing through what he called a magnifier. At the other end of the room, it terminated in the earth. It was a zinc pole at the bottom of a well in the garden. In other words, it was intended that my brain should be exactly like the receiver, a wireless set. This guy wrote this in 1897, wireless set. So uh, <laughs> you've got this guy describing what was left behind and that it involved a large craft and this strange copper wire setup. So um, I found that all very interesting. And there's a number of mysteries around that, including the fact that he said that um, Keeley was trying to develop an Akashic, uh, a device for reading the Akashic record which is interesting because it's something that Edgar Casey had suggested 40 years later could be done and actually gives some kind of hints about the person who's working on it. Now, um, there's a word that came up that caught my eye and it, this is all the HP Lovecraft section of the redevelopment, the rediscovery of Keeley. This takes place, you know, 20, 30 years later, but it's quite interesting. Miss Olivia, do you have that word handy? Oh, God. Nyarla Fotham. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to spell it. N-Y-A-R-L-A-T-H-O-T-H-E-P. How would you pronounce that? Try it again. I, well. Nyarla Fotham. Uh, yeah. Who knows? This Anybody is have so, any ideas? This is something deep in H.P. Lovecraft's work. Okay. And here we go. In the tale of the festival... Uh, this is uh, something called the realms of speculation. It's uh, Theo Pyman's work on free en energy pioneer. The book is from 2004. Uh, in the tale of the festival written in 1923, Lovecraft describes a church in which a tomb is found beneath the altar. Lovecraft modeled his church after a real church. It was not until 1976 that during the restoration of the church, Lovecraft's seemingly fanciful tale of a crypt just before the pulpit was proven to be accurate. The crypt was not located under the present altar, but under an older hidden altar. Lovecraft's fictional tale, based on the fact uh, that was later known, echoes this discovery of a crypt. Now, what they're saying there is that within Lovecraft's different tales, he places absolutely factual information. So that's how this ties into Keeley. Now watch the, <laughs> the development here of the Men in Black shows up in this story and uh there's a very interesting correlation between nimza which is the early airship group and keely that our friend lovecraft stumbles into lovecraft lived most of his life in providence rhode island how far away is that from here maybe about an, an hour? hour 
Um, nice town. And um, the town of Mrs. Staunton, a Paris Golden Dawn member. Lovecraft knew about Keeley and his discoveries through the writing of Charles Fort and partly modeled his Nyarla Thoth ep on John Worrell Keeley. The word holding shades of Nimza, Thoth, and Set, who is the evil entity in the Osiris story. The last that is known about Keeley's invention is that they were shipped to Boston. Lovecraft is known to have made several trips to Boston. In his 1924 tale, The Shunned House, he refers to Dr. Chase. In his 1937 story, The Evil Clergyman, Lovecraft describes a person who finds himself in a house in London. Through the use of a strange little device he finds in his pocket, he summons the forms of a group of clergymen dressed as Anglicans. But clearly, the members of a secret magical cult it is alleged that this is a parallel, the very first, with the men in black, 1924. Um, and it's a device that summons them in the Lovecraft story. And the Lovecraft story looks like a reworking of <laughs> Keeley's life. Um, there's a lot that we're looking at here in terms of that crisscross of when something comes up for air, you know, there's all this talk about Keeley and all the rest of it, Theosophy brings him in, Steiner brings him in, and then whew, the whole thing disappears. And then there's this after echo in people like Lovecraft, in people like Steiner, talking about it and giving us the information of <laughs> this weird name that Lovecraft put on the record. And then with Steiner talking about the Strader effect, the Strader device, and how he makes it in this careful fashion. Now, um, the idea that it wasn't there at the Gertianum when the Gertianum goes up in flames and that Steiner had spirited this thing away, I think gives us a lot of clues and a lot of hints as to what we're talking about in terms of this combination of the moral technology, how it's related to flight, because over and over again, discs and flying show up in relation to it, and the UFO file. And so I'm going to bring in a whole part two of this episode dealing with the UFO file thread directly uh, with this. But before we go any further, Miss Olivia, it's your questions. Oh, God, where Europe. do I even start? First of all, <laughs> I want to say Jonathan is a huge fan and says, this is the best weekly broadcast of depth and breadth anywhere in the world. DJ's steady logic and clear integrity are second to none. And I rewatch every stream at least five times each. Mind bending. <laughs> Wow. It's great to have you here. Uh, and I'm I'm glad you appreciate it. Look, um, we are, you know, in this kind of voyage of mystery together there in the ideas room and uh here on the Dark Journalist X series. I think moving into these different places, there's a great legacy of what's left been left for us, but also the things that we're creating through that legacy and what's happening. Now, uh the legacy is left through the mystery school work. There's no question about it. So, but uh, no, I appreciate that. What okay. Got? Uh, Steiner to God wants to know, uh, DJ, where does Steiner mention this idea of anthroposophy having another chance in a hundred years? Would love to know more about this topic. Steiner mentions it three times. Um, all the lectures that take place between 1918 and 1920, I have uh, probably the number of the lecture. Um, I don't have it <laughs> available right now. He speaks of it and talks about it as a, almost like a portal, you know, and there's a little bit of uh, frustration in his voice that anthroposophy and the mystery schools haven't succeeded because world war one has happened and he sees all that destruction. And, you know, they're no fools in anthroposophy and theosophy. They've saw this stuff coming and they were trying to figure out how to avoid it. And instead, they got one of the worst wars in history, and they could see there was more coming, they, you know, the development of the Nazis. And the Nazis regard Steiner as a rival, a cult rival, and, um, you know, they drive him out of Germany. He can't even speak uh, at events. And when he creates the Gertian and when they torch it, it's a direct message, like, we're taking you down. But the thing is... Um, 
I think what Steiner is doing is he's looking out and he's, he's making the best efforts where they are, but he sees that anthroposophy somehow in a loop in a hundred years has a chance again. Uh, I put the actual date at 2020 is when that hundred year loop started again. And the opportunity came about because of the meddling of the deep state and some of those occult secret societies in the things like the lockdown the incredible uh, occult aspects of that and in the rollout of the false version of the UFO file disclosure that happened again. They, they try to reroad, uh, reroute this thing uh, after announcing it in 2017. During the pandemic, they try to roll out the same things. So they were like, hey, look, <laughs> it's, those sa- it's the Tic Tac and all that kind of stuff. This, these are the things, and this is the time period. That's why 2020 was so crucial and uh, I think that Steiner then, he may reference it earlier. Like I said, 1918 is maybe the first reference, but in 20, uh, 1920, saying that that 100-year window opens up again for anthroposophy is no question. Meaning the mystery schools had another chance because he had seen it as a mystery school failure that we got World War I. So um, there are other hints from the Casey work, from the Gurdjieff work, and from theosophy that give us the same idea that there's something opening back up. There's an opportunity that's going to come around again. And that this is one opportunity, what they're bringing in and it sets a foundation. And here we are in kind of the, the new era of the mysteries. Um, so there's no question he was predicting it there, but you know, his predictions are remarkable. What did he predict for the 21st century? We never think of him as some kind of Nostradamus character, but the predictions are just off the charts. Incredible. Here it is. Here, I'm knocking the microphone around. Mm-hmm. Go for it. Uh, Jimmy Lyle Kenimer, DJ, do you think uh, the Antichrist equals Armon? Also, do you think Elon is ex-protect? No, I don't think Elon is ex-protect at all. Um, and uh, I don't think that, uh, somebody like Musk has that many deep seated convictions. I think that we see him show up where he's needed. <laughs> um, the Antichrist thing, certainly uh, Armon is the opposite of Christ, and yet overcoming Armon enhances Christ. And, um, you know, Christ's incarnation in, in anthroposophy puts limits on Armand, which is incredibly crucial for humanity. And, um, but facing off against Armand is something that humanity has to do. And we can see it all the time, you know, in the best people who are getting sucked into the idea that they can be enhanced. Well, you know, enhance me as a human. Well, everyone wants to be better, but you, you are a human being. You're not a, a technology, you know, so um, they introduced this idea of Neuralink the same way. This is Musk doing it. You know, he wants to open up your skull and insert a chip. Well, uh, there's no question that the scientific possibility of somebody who's in, you know, a paraplegic or something, that something could be done. There, there is an advancement that's taken place there. But that's not what these people are about. It feels to me that that's the ruse to get this involved. So in essence, you know, these are billionaires associated with DARPA who want to put chips in your brain. You know, that sounds like a slave system to me. Does it sound like a slave system to you? Um, so yeah, I, you know, it's, it's not, um, being highly suspicious of this system is, is healthy. And, um, I don't think, you know, I do want to comment on this. There was a weird, incredible fascination with Taylor Swift over the past couple of weeks. (laughs) And what I don't like is that the conservative media is driving it because they see her associating herself or herself with uh, Biden and all the rest of it. You know, I have to tell you that um, there are distractions and there are distractions. But when you look at the kind of pseudo alternative media and conservative people getting all into that, you know, it's opportunist and everything else, but it's also, it's sick, unhealthy fascination. You know, anybody who's an entertainer can support anybody they want. 
And of course there are psyops around entertainers and all the rest of it. But this, you know, going round and round obsession with it is there's an illness associated with that. And it also shows you which conservative figures um, who are not trustworthy and who are not what they appear to be. And they, they want you wrapped up in these kind of false things to keep you going because they have to dish out these stories all the time. So it's weird. Um, you know, on one hand you have this kind of sick MSNBC, uh, system protecting Biden cult and all the crazy COVID stuff and all the rest. And then on the other side, you have this thing that is supposed to stand up to all that, but then they, they love trapping people in weird things too, and taking advantage of them and putting up the two minutes hate person, you know, here's Taylor Swift, <laughs> you know, Taylor Swift is the whole thing is absurd. And it's, nobody should be thinking about that. If you're interested in music, listen to Taylor Swift. If she promotes, you know, if they use her as part of a psyop to get Biden and whatever, you know, I mean, they've always been doing that. Michael Jackson used to do ads for president Reagan. <laughs> okay. I mean, they do use them. Yeah. But this kind of attention, you know, and the craziness of it, I think. Um, and, you know, for me, uh, when you see people do that, and then conservatively, I'll mention one of them, Jack Brasovic, like, you know, you're just, they become useless, whatever they were up to in the first place. Those things are absurd. And well, getting, a lot of it is clickbait. It is, it mm -hmm. is, yeah. And, uh, but I have a problem with it. I like calling out independent media because that's where I live. Mm -hmm. And so when I see things like Tim Cast or Prosobic and all that kind of weird, it's supposed to be that this is the you know a new media or conservative media to have a backlash against this thing of the mainstream media. I don't consider I I consider it highly manipulated, uh, and I consider them you know getting into things that are a brain drain. So um, I think there is tremendous media out there. Uh, there's all kinds of exciting things going on around the independent side. But we do, you know, we have to be careful about large forces, large money coming into the independent space, you know, and that's where you get things like, I don't know, <laughs> Megyn Kelly talking about UFOs and bringing CIA people on to talk about it. You know, you need a better standard in general, I think, in uh, alternative media. And the, the Taylor Swift thing is a really good example. Like that's. Well, you're locking yourself into its external focus, right? Love her, wow. hate her. Oh, it's ridiculous. It's still, you're looking at someone else. You're looking at a rich person, someone you'll never touch, that you don't have a relationship with, and you're putting all this energy and emotional energy into that. Into oh, yeah, that. you're supposed what to hate. What about working on yourself? I exactly, mean, that's the yeah. whole point, is what can we be doing about creating a p parallel we society? Know, we know in uh, George Orwell's 1984, they gave them two minutes hate to keep them brainwashed, and they throw up Goldstein, you know, who's the, the figure to hate. Um, this is a very important thing left to us by Orwell, and we can't allow ourselves to fall into anything like that. And uh, I think the idea, you know, you see the superficial thing going on on what's supposedly alternative media is that stuff even alternative media you know i don't think so <laughs> but uh in any case it's dumb so you know we need uh we need a, a better conversation about important issues you know spend that time going into cbdc's you know uh and things of that nature it's funny i remember i got all this tremendous support during the Mellon thing and people were emailing me and giving me messages like thank you for uh outing melon and his control of crush and the whole ufo thing and uh on twitter there were people in melon's timeline being like how dare you you know and all this kind of stuff they don't they don't want the truth they just want the fairy tale that the cia people are giving them and i found that interesting i thought about what um Catherine Austin Fitz had said about 2024 that it was the year of pushback. So, and I believe that. I think she's right. And part of that pushback is pushback against the false UFO file piece. And the, I, you know, I'm more interested in that than going after Taylor Swift. And it's interesting to me too, um, because someone wrote to me and uh, they said, you know, why, why bother even going up against Mellon? You can't change it anyway. 
And it made me think of another quote. This one was from Jim Garrison, who had tried to prosecute the CIA in the murder of President Kennedy. And uh, when they asked him about it, and he said, oh, yeah, you know, they escaped conviction, but they knew they'd been danced with. So uh, I guess when it comes to these things, you know, I'll consider myself somebody <laughs> who's going to be doing a lot of dancing this year. Everyone, this is uh, the Dark Journalist X Series 165, Psychic Airships and the Strata UFO Nightside Mystery. We're taking your questions, excellent questions. It's great to see so many of you there in the ideas room. And um, I did mention the melon thing there. I do promise you a, a report just on that and the things I was able to uncover and um, that kind of ongoing uh, bizarre controversy of this weird DOD official pressuring this UFO whistleblower. It's an issue that won't go away because the whole field grinds to a halt because they're gonna drag this whistleblower before Congress but now Congress is getting the information that Mellon is controlling him. So Mellon's going to have to come down from the high tower and talk about it. But in the meantime, we're going to talk about it. And, um, you know, and I say that as somebody who got it from the horse's mouth, in this case, Grush told me that that's what was going on. It is crucial that Mellon not slip on, on this one, that he needs to be called out for it and account for it or else that whole field just goes away basically um but so let's remember that thing about pushback this year the ufo file is crucial in it and the election look election 2024 is the there's a central piece with the ufo file they've already brought it through in the media they're already tampering with it trump had already developed the space force to grab this issue back under executive control look this is the era uh, of the UFO file for the 2024 election. Anyone who leaves that out and, you know, they've significantly left it out of the Bobby campaign, which is a huge mistake. Hello, <laughs> Amaryllis Fox. And um, on the Trump side, it's very interesting. <laughs> he mentions John Trump a lot, which is, he's definitely talking about the UFO file there, but uh, he needs to get out in front of it too. It's going to be crucial and people will relate to it. It'll be a huge advantage, especially with all the tampering uh, going on around the UFO file in the back rooms uh, with the deep state individuals directly connected to this administration, by the way. And uh, supposedly there's someone in this administration named Jake Sullivan. We know the national security advisor. And um, this guy apparently really, really dislikes this show and is upset <laughs> that um, we're putting things out there. Uh, so I find that interesting too. So, you know, but I'm, I'm glad to upset people in government. Yes. Before we move on from Warner, um, I just wanted to ask this one question. Uh, VKK oh, yeah. says, was Warner saying on Twitter that the Mellon family was taking orders from aliens? <laughs> no, I, I, he put up a very, um, it's such an important quote about the CIA and the Mellons uh, that I could read it, actually. Please do. Well, I have to get my phone to do it, love. But um, let's see. Why don't you kind of give us something there and I'll find it. Okay. So I did want to mention this. Um, I have no idea how to pronounce this. Wajatala uh, Sheik says, <laughs> music also changes water crystals. Mm. Nena says, is that cymatics frequency with tuning forks? And Joseph Tugas, do you think that John Hutchinson uh, studied Keeley to cause the oh, Hutchinson effect? Isn't that interesting? Wow. Um, Hutchinson's work, and a lot of that was really um, brought out during Judy Wood investigating 9-11. I thought uh, this is fascinating. But there's no question. But they decided on the government side to approach him and kind of keep him under their umbrella. And <laughs> you can see that happening. Um, but for me, you know, this is quite fascinating because, um, all right, well, I found the Warner quote. Let me read it okay. while I have it in front of me. Uh, this is an excerpt now from uh, an article that it's called Spiritual Warfare by Sarah Diamond, but it was Warner who put it out today. The Mellon family and their in-laws also have a rich tradition in the netherworlds of the U.S. intelligence community, dating back to at least World War II. 
Both Paul Mellon and David Bruce, Andrew Mellon's son and son-in-law, respectively, served in the Office of Strategic Services, OSS, the precursor to the CIA. After the war, the relationship continued, with the CIA frequently using various Mellon family foundations as a serious uh, source of funding for various projects. One Mellon highly active in such pursuits was Richard Mellon Scaife, noted at length before here. This is a major neocon. Uh, who maintained a decade-spanning assassination uh, association <laughs> assassination with the CIA. Indeed, uh, Scaife's ties to the intelligence community span many years. He owned and operated Forum World Features, an international CIA news outlet that supplied 300 newspaper until its exposure in 1975. And he had been one of the most generous sugar daddies of the New Right, providing the seed money for the Heritage Foundation, and the Committee for the Survival of a Free Congress. So the the background there of that side of the Mellon thing and Paul Mellon and all the rest of it, very, very deep with the, the uh, hardcore deep state. What's interesting is there's a strain of um, the Mellons which also you know, did good things, like they were involved with bringing Gurdjieff out, and that is uh, John Warner's line, actually, his mom, he also describes as a hippie, someone who's really into, um, you know, subjects like UFOs and things of that nature. So there's there are always splits in these families. But we're seeing, I think, with Chris Mellon and that whole thing and the strange arrogance that they aim against Warner, who they kind of maybe look at as, as um, you know, a traitor to their billionaire class or something. But Warner, somebody who's, you know, understood his dad being part of mj12 and everything understands how important that issue is and doesn't want the sideshow and circus that they've been trying to roll out uh through the deep state version of false ufo disclosure which we've exposed on this program and so warner and i are both joined <laughs> in that and it was very interesting because the troll attack that came after mellon got called out i didn't say anything about warner when i was calling out mellon but I mean, he was aware of our interviews, <laughs> I'm sure. But they went after they went after Warner. So uh, you know, that's very interesting, and I would say it, it represents um, fear on their part. And I believe that their reaction to me in sending out the creepy DIA uh, son of Chris Mellon, which is a really sleazy thing to do. I mean, I, I, I was trying to think about this. You know, is there anyone in the audience who has kids? You know, is there a dad out there who has kids who would send their kid out to fight, you know, their battles for them? I mean, this is this is pretty low. I was thinking about it. You know, you can have all the money in the world and still, you know, not be <laughs> very successful in life. Um, so for me, that was that was a really low moment. I've never seen anything that low. I was trying to think about this. I, I, you know, I've always considered Corey Good <laughs> one of the lowest moments in the UFO field, but th <laughs> this was this was probably the lowest thing. And, uh, you know, don't involve your family <laughs> in this, and, um, you know, especially not your, you know, kind of mentally challenged son. Whoa. Now, what I would say is this, though, that it, when people do things like that. And they blow their kind of intel cool. It, they're afraid, and they're afraid because they're lying. And when I hit at it with what Grush told me, and they know they can't get around that because it's well documented on both sides, they're afraid because now it's out there that Mellon is controlling the UFO whistleblower that they are hoping to get this deep state UFO defense office through. So you see, it is a really big problem on their side. So we need to be aware of that going forward and uh look investigative journalism i always say it it's adversarial journalism and uh it's not it can't be personal it's not personal but it's certainly adversarial because that's the only way you're going to get to the thing so uh if those people were honest i told them i've i said i'll give you a Streamyard link anytime you can come on and explain exactly um why grush is intimidated by you and thought he would get blowback if he talked to me uh, and faced tough questions from the public. That's that's a sick level of control. And in the environment I, I operate in, uh, there's just something about me when, when the, you know, it's, I can, <laughs> when I do research in dark journalism, you know, you deal with a lot of weird stuff. 
but, and you don't always, you aren't always involved in it, but when it directly involves you, um, you definitely, you get a, a close up glimpse of that illness. And, um, you know, they, they're, it's a pretty sick group that's operating this. I can tell you, you know, and they're, they're sick <laughs> and, uh, the, the actions and the overreactions on social media and things represent a fear and they're afraid of me and they're afraid of Warner, not because we want them to be afraid, but because, um, we're bringing out truths that challenge their false narrative and they can't have that. So we've seen this in a number of situations. We saw it with the COVID lockdown as well. When the authorities get challenged, they go into weird attack modes. And, uh, you know, we saw them attack Bobby Kennedy uh, on that level extensively for exposing what they were up to. And it turns out three years later, well, all the stuff that he said was correct. <laughs> so, you know... Uh, I put it out there. It was a fact. Look, here are the facts. Mellon himself intimidated Grush, who's a UFO whistleblower, and told him not to face tough questions from me. That's control. This is the same guy, Grush, who's supposed to break open the UFO secrets and talk to Congress and all that, but Mellon has him cowering to talk to me? I mean, think about that. Really think about it then you understand the <laughs> field that we're in and you understand why we've been covering the UFO file on the level that we have. This year, in the election year, it is going to be crucial. So when they have UFO whistleblowers talking before $550 billion in one room with a bunch of CIA and Homeland Security people, watch out. <laughs> because if you thought the COVID off was something, wait till they run the UFO threat up. Everyone, you're watching The Dark Journalist Show this is Psychic Airships, mm -hmm. Straighter UFO Nightside Mystery. We're taking your questions. A fantastic group out there in the ideas room. And um, my thanks to uh, John Warner IV for uh, you know setting the record straight on those people. And I was happy to read his quote. What else you got? Just to finish that up, Mitakwe Oyasin, uh, DJ, I have to ask, have they directly or indirectly threatened you? Uh well, I, you know, what they tried to do with me was uh, they tried to do the old arm around the shoulder thing, which was, you know, you're going to be able to be read in on this stuff. And um, th these were the little things that they were following up with. And the, the, the grush thing is kind of part of that. They wanted me to be in this thing, expecting that this guy was going to give me little tidbits, you know, from the skiff. <laughs> And um, I don't have any interest in that. It's funny because we, they did all of these activities under a great misunderstanding. I haven't the slightest interest in being a fly on the wall on their false UFO disclosure. And nothing, nothing is going to stop me from exposing uh, the ex-protect activities around the UFO file. It's not going to happen. So in the meantime, uh, I can say this, which is... I think they, they showed a lot about who they are just in the last week, and I'm glad that they did because I would have preferred them come out and really talk about it. Uh, they're invited to a gentleman's debate anytime, anytime I'm here. What are they afraid of? What is Mellon afraid of? It begs the question, doesn't it? So it lets you know we're in weird times. <laughs> this is a guy who's a national security official. You know Why is he afraid of dark journalists, right? He has something to hide. Problems. Problems, plural. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Brenda Fisher, are intention and frequency entangled at a quantum level? Music? Well, see, this is interesting because I just did a uh, members interview with Dr. Joseph Farrell. This is a part two of an episode that we did. And um, I just put that out. But that is all about resonance and UFOs and Tesla. And this gets into the John Trump piece as well. And I wanted to say um, there's something, I have something here about John Trump. And there were some psychics that I didn't get to tonight, including Emma Britton and um, Maria Ortzik. And, uh, 
It's interesting too, because they play right into this because of course, a lot of the activity around German development comes directly out of this Vril group. Well, what does Vril even mean? Where does it come from? It's fascinating because it comes from Bulwer Lytton's uh, novels and the coming race, the things that Bulwer Lytton could see. We find in Casey's work and in Steiner's work, they talk about Bulwer Lytton being in and read into the mystery schools. So what he's giving us back there is so advanced. Um, and Vril, if you read that, Nanoni and uh, the, the Coming Race, the, the idea is that the group is operating this as underground. They live underground, a subterranean race. And <laughs> so we have a lot to work with there, but this idea of this unlimited energy source that gave them, you know, this incredible uh, ability technologically was all based on a psychic life force. It's kind of the chi piece. And so the Vril is human magnetism, human life. And um, that's the great advantage in all this. So when you get around things like uh, the UFO file, the reason that they harness psychics and psychic energy for it is because that's the driver. So this is what we learn on a very deep level when you dive into the mystery and you combine the mystery school knowledge with the overlap of the secrecy around the UFO file. So, um, you know, there might be technological aspects and somebody, some of these scientists, um, we'll look at something like the UFO file and they'll go into all these dizzying details about, you know, it shows this kind of signature speed wise and things like that when they have sightings. But I can tell you that um, if you're going to get a grasp on it, you're going to need to go beyond a traditional scientific look. You have to see that this thing is operating. You have to understand the concept that we put forward as a pothium. You can call it anything you want, but pothium, I think is the <laughs> correct term when you study the the cases, uh, when you study those, you know one of those cases involves that Japanese expert pilot who was a commercial pilot with Alaska Airlines, and he's going over Alaska and he sees this gigantic craft beneath him, and you can hear him talking back and forth about it. You know, it has this characteristic, it has that characteristic. Oh wait, I can see through it. So he's looking, he's seeing, you know, ocean or mountains beneath the thing. The thing is not fully there. It's halfway there and it's halfway not there. Well, this, this is a pretty advanced <laughs> apothium science. Those things lie directly in the, the mystery material and can be, we can get at them without the government or anything else, just by having some good scientists and some good researchers on the mysteries together uh, or damn good psychic. <laughs> what do you got well and i think i just wanted to throw this out to the audience going are you starting to get the idea of how magical you are we are oh wow as human yeah. beings boy is that true it the um the message of the mysteries is just how powerful an individual is and um in the gurdjieff work they always say uh, as above, so below, you are the representation, you're the embodiment of the entire universe and one being. <laughs> so uh, Casey talks about being, developing the awareness, the reason for development, the spiritual development is to recognize yourself as one with the whole, but you're independent. You're part of the whole creation, but you are also uh, individually independent. And it's quite interesting because, uh, you know, you live and operate in your being in the, the Casey work. You are the focal point of the entire creation. <laughs> That's quite dramatic. And Jesus said that we are capable of greater miracles than what he did when he was incarnate. Oh, my God. Yeah, that is fascinating as well. Um I love, there's a great line that Jesus says when, you know, the disciples come to him and they're like, we went into these different towns preaching your doctrine and everything. We're getting rocks thrown at us and everything else. And, and Jesus says, look, I'm going to tell you something, you know, there's going to be a period of time when people are going to do that 
stuff to you and they they think they're doing god a service you know like <laughs> because like tough it out because um you know the, you're in for more <laughs> okay i want to say lois said steiner describes bulwer lytton as having salons where he dressed in exotic attire and a harpist played a line of music between lines of his talk oh look <laughs> i mean i love these eccentrics yeah i can tell you uh steiner also um he's at a nexus between he's aware of the american mystery schools the british ones who's operating in Europe and what he sees coming is the problem. He says is that, Oh, these schools are getting together and here's what they want to do. They want to enslave the East and they want to install their rulers in the West. So in America and the UK, they want their guys installed and they want the East as slaves. Now I think about the Russian situation a lot when I hear that. Um, but I also think of how ingenious Steiner was in that period, because you're looking at Nazi Germany, and certainly that was part of the plan that they had. So he's envisioning this in this period of time, and he's seeing from a mystical level what the secret societies are up to. And if we look behind the curtain on many of those leaders in the 20th century that got us into uh, World War II and everything, uh, and the ones that are rolling us towards World War III in the 21st century, we lift that veil a little bit and you see all kinds of mystery school activity behind them, including Hitler, including FDR, including Truman. And, um, you know, on the Japanese side, Mussolini, forget it, you know. So there's there are all these forces that are operational in the background. And um, I want to say that the UK is kind of a super center when it comes to mystery school activity. And I would say that France and America are probably the two, uh, France, UK, and America, are the, those are really the three top centers for that. Absolutely fascinating. A cult fan has joined us. Hey, that's great. Um, he says, I'm wondering if DJ knows the story that Steiner was buried in his Masonic regalia. Uh, well, it's interesting because um, I always thought some people said it was in um, a Rosicrucian outfit. So I think there's a lot of crisscross on that story. And uh, apparently they made him an honorary Mason. So it's interesting because when he talks, he gives lectures about what Masonry is and all the rest of it. And I'm, I think to myself when I read that, he couldn't be a Mason if he was giving out all these details about it. Mm. So I think at the end of his life, they make him an honorary Mason. But um, during his life, I don't think what's interesting is almost all of the theosophical people like Annie Besant and others, they bestow, um, they even, the Masons even bestow these uh, <laughs> degrees upon Crowley, you know, and Crowley writes a book and he, he puts out all this information and he gets a call from the top person in the Scottish Rite masonry, and they say, you know, we have to make you a mason immediately. And he says, why? He says, you just let out, like, one of the top Masonic secrets in your last book. And, <laughs> you know, Crowley's looking for connections everywhere. He's like, yeah, plug me in, baby, you know, do it up. But um, I'll tell you this. Oh, what's interesting when you look at uh, Steiner is they, in the period he was actually thriving a lot toward the end. He had rebuilt, he had plans to rebuild the Gurdianum after they took it out. They did a number of things that moves against him, including poisoning him at the end. And he didn't want that to be a big part of his legacy. So he was determined that that not really be let out. But um, he was poisoned. And when he dies from that poisoning, all of the black magic mystical groups in the UK and the U S celebrate because they know one of their main guys is gone. One of their main opponents, but, um, it has that feeling, uh, it, you know, kind of the Obi-Wan thing, which is if you strike me down, I'll become twice as powerful and just feel how the Steiner stuff resonates now uh, much more powerfully than uh, the dark side. It is, I think it's quite remarkable. Yes. <laughs> we had the best chat. 
<laughs> I love the ideas room. I'm not dead yet says, I heard that Mozart was murdered by the Masons after he released the magic fluid, which reeled certain Masonic mysteries. I, you know, somebody puts up a comment and it's a whole little <laughs> rabbit hole right there. Itself. It's just fascinating. Yeah. Um, that's very interesting. And if you want to send more about that admin at darkjournalist.com, I'll read it. And I read everything that comes in, but I'll try to respond to that one. We got so much email that I can't respond to all of them, unfortunately. I'd like to. Um, I wanted to read this quote from Blavatsky regarding how the esoteric schools move through the culture, the way that it happens, so that people understand this. I thought this was particularly fascinating. Occult philosophy divulges few of its most important and vital mysteries. It drops them like precious pearls, one by one, far and wide apart, and even this only when forced to do so by the evolution, evolutionary tidal wave that carries on humanity slowly, silently but steadily, toward the dawn of the sixth race of mankind. For once out of the safe custody of their legitimate heirs and keepers, those mysteries cease to be a cult. They fall into the public domain and have to run the risk of becoming curses more open than blessings in the hands of the selfish, of the Cains of the human race, going to the Cain and Abel story, and Cain slaying Abel. Um, all kinds of clues in what she says. Here's a little more. Nevertheless, whenever such individuals as the discoverer of etheric force are bone men with peculiar psychic mental capabilities, she's referring to Keeley here, they are generally and more frequently helped than allowed to go unassisted, groping on their way. If left to their own resources, they very soon fall victims to martyrdom or become the prey of unscrupulous spectators, speculators. But they are helped only on the condition that they should not become, whether consciously or unconsciously, in additional peril to their age, a danger to the poor, now offered in daily holocaust by the less wealthy to the very wealthy. Think about that in the context of the period that we're in. Whew. Written in 1886. Um, so we can see <laughs> there, you know, and it's interesting to me because when I think about Gurdjieff and Casey, and we have Steiner, facing off with the World War I piece and saying, I'm letting all the Araman information out. But then you get Casey and Gurdjieff going through World War II. You know, they, they're aware of the peril that humanity's in and what Gurdjieff called the terror of the situation. So they're laying these things out here and looking at these groups who are, you know, um, so motivated to enslave humanity. And behind them, they can see the great specter of this harmonic force. So, you know, they are sharing that and we are kind of plugging into it to kind of open up and change the destiny. And um, that's why I think, you know, and I've said this about censorship, I think they fear conversations like the one we have here in the ideas room around these things. Because when a number of us uh, take in these types of things, the collective psychic force of informed creative people that's very very dangerous uh to these people so uh there's no question that the heavy censorship that we're under there's a there's a reason for it and i don't let any of that stuff go to my head <laughs> at all you know but i'm i am aware of it though and i'm glad to share that with you guys yes collective psychic force i love that <laughs> oh yeah my god the things that we can do collectively mm -hmm. i think of emma Britton and how she said that whenever they had circles where they were doing you know because she came out of a whole piece where these uh, schools had used her as a channel and uh she said whenever there were circles of people they got 10 times the psychic results than when they operated on their own so I think that's very telling. Some people do need to work on their own uh, psychically, but collectively, um, collective intent, watch out. <laughs> and I don't think it requires a lot of people either. Yes. I'm going to read this from Bo Krills, who says, what's so beautiful about our ideas room, 
and I love that he called it our idea. <laughs> yes. Is when they send their flunkies to blow us up, they stick out like a sore thumb. They don't belong here. It's so true. There's <laughs> there's what I call beauty and coherence mm. in the ideas room. And um, and you can see a troll a mile away, right? Because they, they come in with a different frequency, a different energy, and different intention. It's very wow, obvious. Wow, that is really true. Um, yeah, there's no question about it. And, you know, you start getting things up to a certain level. And uh, it reminds me of a story that Aspensky tells that going to Gurdjieff's place was always very strange because no one could lie there. And the atmosphere was such, the vibe was such that there was lying was very easily detectable. So I found that interesting. <laughs> and I, I, you know, it's the same here in a sense that the, uh, there's a kind of a, a feeling and a tone to the work that we're doing. I wanted to say, I didn't get to John Trump enough in this episode and I will because he plays into this, but I found some uh, very interesting information about experiments that he did, which I may be able to tie into the psychic development piece, although they were done under uh, the auspices of doing radiation training. I believe there may have been a psychic component. I found a number of uh, images of him doing this work at MIT. And, you know, after reading the Keeley stuff, these pictures look very interesting to me. And of course, uh, that's John Trump there in the center, right here. And he's doing these tests here. And of course, it could be for a variety of things. But just think about that psychic technology piece with John Trump. And then think of the idea of moral technology. Um, John Trump seemed to be was a very high-minded character. So I found that particularly interesting. And of course, his work with Van de Graaff gets us directly into that Keeley style work. This all leads John Trump into space research. That's where he goes. Think about that in relation to what we're talking about here. Everyone, you're watching the Dark Journalist X series. This is episode 165, Psychic Airships. The Strata UFO Nightside Forces Mystery. We're going to take two more questions and then we're going to leave you. Uh, and uh, we're also going to tell you that February 23rd is a very special date for a very special two hour presentation, uh, documentary presentation here at 8 p.m. Eastern, February 23rd. Mark the date. That's about three weeks away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Okay. Two so questions. Regarding, well, okay, but I'm going to group them. Okay. <laughs> so the Keeley picture, this is from before. Uh, Anonymity says, is that NIMSA adjacent? I thought they were the 500 miles an hour progenitors. And David Donaway, the Keeley airship was successfully demonstrated to the U.S. War Department in 1896. Keeley brought the airship from zero to 500 miles per hour within seconds. The airship sightings began in 1897, one year after Keeley uh, War Department department demonstration. Mr. Keeley said that when the plates were polarized with, quote, negative attraction, the airship would rise and float above the ground. Exactly. And you picked up on that date, 1897 there. You know what's weird with you mentioning that? I think if I can do this, <laughs> I'll pull off the ultimate find at the same time because I was just, aha, here it is. Okay, no. Well, th this is what's interesting. So this author, Cairo, that I mentioned earlier, who was giving a description of Keeley's laboratory, uh, he is describing what he saw in 1897. Now, that is quite interesting um, because all the airship <laughs> mysteries start there, and there he is saying, oh, there's this gigantic aerial, A-E, R I A L, not antenna. It's an aerial. It's a craft, just like the craft that he's using. And uh, he's saying that it's on top of the roof and connected with all these copper wires. Well, there's a story. Um, here it is. And this might answer your whole question. That thing that uh, somebody mentioned there about NIMSA. Yeah, look, they're they're kind of in the same time period, same ballpark. 
Um, and I don't know if Keeley was working with NIMSA. <laughs> he seems like somebody was operating independently and then the mystery schools tried to help him and the corporations and the political forces wanted his stuff so badly that they tried to throw controversies at him and squeeze him. Um, but certainly, yeah, there's a crossover with what we hear about NIMSA and what we hear about Keeley in terms of the, the tech side. Um, now, here's what's interesting as regarding NIMSA. And watch the crisscross here because it does involve John Trump, but I promise I'll get this in a separate episode. Trump Tesla? Well, we've picked up Trump Tesla in 1943. Let's try an early version. Let's want something earlier? <laughs> Also living in New York was millionaire John Jacob Astor, inventor and acquaintance of both Keeley and Tesla, who almost half century later chose to use the term apogee, which he borrowed from Greg's Across the Zodiac. It is inviting to speculate that Astor's literary borrowing was on another level, meant as a subtle hint. The Nimza perhaps meant the New York Z Zodiacal Motor Association. Now, what's interesting about this is uh, Astor is also a major funder and partner with the Trumps early on. And also Astor is associated with the Nine. So when Astor shows up here as an acquaintance of both Keeley and Tesla, we have a Keeley Tesla, John Jacob Astor, and I think what we're going to find is that Astor is one of the people who's, who uh, went under on the Titanic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so that thread of Keeley, Tesla, Astor, and then Trump with Astor, that might get us into very deep places. And when you find somebody like Jack Smith <laughs> looking for secret rooms over at Mar-a-Lago that he missed with the FBI raid, it looks like we're looking at the technology thing, something associated with Trump and that background of his uncle, because Trump keeps going up there and talking about Uncle John. It's crucial <laughs> that we get the steganography of the conversation that's going back and forth there between the deep state and Trump. There's no question about it. Last question, Miss Olivia. Okay. But, oh, yeah, the 1897 airship thing. Um, there is a description of somebody walking around inside this craft and given Keeley's developments, it looks like a Keeley craft that the person's walking around inside of. They get a tour, <laughs> as it were. Uh, but there's no question that that whole advanced, you know, people were flying around long before the Wright brothers. And we know from the Cosmos Club that they housed the Wright brothers at the Cosmos Club in DC. So they wanted to roll them out as kind of the face of flight, but uh, the Cosmos Club was very, very much aware and eventually would become UFO Bilderberg. Yes, Miss Olivia. All right, I could go in two different directions. Um, Use your intuition. <laughs> okay. You have a great intuition. Well, okay, we'll, we'll go into Arma. <laughs> <laughs> so I have three questions related. Okay, so Jackson says, Makes me believe these supercomputers are just vessels for that aramonic force to occupy and manifest itself physically in this realm. Max Muller says, what is the best example of Araman manifesting in our culture now? Lots to choose from, I know. And Viking says, could the eighth sphere be a human-built satellite net? So could you, they're all related. Could you talk about... Oh yeah. How, um, what, how we are seeing Araman and the eighth sphere being manifested before our very eyes? Well, that's really interesting. Um, I see it all the time. And um, I think that the kind of entrainment technology that's involved is something to pull you in. Certainly AI is something that would pull you in. But when they were developing these quantum computer uh, chips and giving them the ability to make all these decisions and things, that's pure Araman because there's no, there's no spirituality behind it. It's just this calculating uh, reasoning. Clever. You know, it's clever, but it has no heart. Um, but I think the movement towards making technology God is pure Araman. And uh, 
I think that the approach on the UFO file side to make that an assist, there was a point at which they try to use, you know, this is more organic, I think, but there was more of a spirituality crossover with the UFO file. What they're trying to do now is make it, oh, you know, the advanced technology um, is a religion, you know, and um, it becomes a very slippery slope because uh, on one hand, you know, you know that they've been holding things back for a hundred years, <laughs> but on the other hand, you also know that when they roll out the things that they have to roll out, that they are not, these aren't the noble leaders that will help lead a culture forward. You know, this isn't John Kennedy, you know, um, who wants to build a new world and make, you know, humanity go to the moon and things like that. There's a much more devious thing about consolidating, overwhelming, depopulating for control purpose, purposes at this point in our development, which I believe will be looked back on as an incredibly primitive insanity, you know, much like when they look back on World War II and all the insanity that went on there, they're going to look back at this period and say, what happened <laughs> to these people? Well, um, it's, it's a very small but advanced occult secret society that is operational through all of these various cultural devolutions. And um, it is very easy, I think, to, you know, we have all these kind of trick names like Illuminati and things like that, which was a real group after all, but it doesn't go deep enough. You know, uh, I think that unveiling the battle between the mystery schools and having the UFO file piece right in dead center of it gives the public a much better shot at understanding who's operating there. Um, but I think, remember that Armand works on the mind. So it, it, needs to, you see all these people developing, um, you know, these kind of weird stigmas and weird complexes. Uh, the gender thing is part of that too. Not to say that there aren't people who have that, um, legitimately I'm saying that the inculcation, the development of it in the culture is on purpose. And, um, that's also very harmonic because the more that humanity is at the hands of the scientific dictatorship, the more that Armand shows up as the Lord and master of the realm <laughs> as it were. So I think when you get into the real anthroposophical vision that Steiner's having, he's saying, Oh, this can go very badly for humanity. The entire spiritual evolutionary track can be thrown off um, by this cutting off of humanity from its spiritual center. So you're dealing with a, a scientific evolution, which is now working against a spiritual evolution. And I think that's why he called his work spiritual science in the grand scheme of things. You can merge the two as they were merged in the era of like Goethe and people like that. You'd have the poet, philosopher, scientist. They understood, they separated them and they made them into separate businesses. <laughs> And, um, you know, just like you get a whole row of unethical uh, doctors in relation to the COVID affair, you get a, a series of unethical politicians. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing all these splits everywhere. And what you are trying to find to hold the culture together is a solid root of, you know, just like Steiner was saying with the moral, uh, technology you know it's you're looking for a fundamental center in a culture that can take humanity and develop it and what the harmonic thing is all about devouring it so uh we get two very different versions of a future there and so that's why the x protect x share thing i think uh, comes into this as well it's the same it's the same battle through different archetypes as it were. And with that, Miss Olivia, I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to answer this one last question. Sure. Okay. So Chuck Bam said, can we stop this new war? And I, I was thinking immediately of that famous Casey story that you've shared before about the group of students that gather together for the, for the battle in prayer. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a number of, of things. Of course, the power of prayer is dramatic in all this, in all of the work. And, uh, you know, for some reason, the Gurdjieff answer comes to mind, though, which is that as long as we're operating on an unconscious mechanical level, anything can happen. World War III, war with Russia, whatever. The key is for humanity to get out of the mechanical sleep and to reconnect uh, on one hand with the deeper faculties that are lying there latent and sleeping. So that moves to our spirituality and some of the mysteries that are involved there. So um, I think as long as we're on this track, and you know, I think the Gurdjieff example is good because you know the whole thing's based around the period is the Russian Revolution, World War I, World War II, They've seen it, they're up close with it, but they're still operating with mystery principles. And uh, what he's seeing and witnessing is the intense brainwashing uh, of one side to be against the other side. So he's trying to fine tune his method to give to the public and say, you know, the more self aware that you are, the less you'll fall into identifying with this psychosis. So that's what we need to find in ourselves is the ability not to over-identify. That's why I even brought up the thing about, uh, and it may sound superficial, but the Taylor Swift thing, because it's a weird identification to keep you in like a, a hate persona, you know? And um, so there's, those are the types of things that put a culture to sleep. And if anything, you know, being awake in this period is being centered, being objective and not in and being non-judgmental in a sense. So, you know, you can assess something, you can discern a thing, you know, I mean, if somebody's drunk, <laughs> you don't want them taking your car keys and driving you home. Right. But you don't have to judge them as a drunk to do that. You can discern that, you know, this person shouldn't have car keys. So it's a very interesting objective point of view that we need to be coming to in order to avoid these things. Um, but I think if you want to avoid World War III, you need to get rid of the Biden regime. That's step one. <laughs> and uh, I, I guarantee you that the chances with this committee in the background controlling this brainless um, administration is one of the most deadly uh, situations I think that we've been in and the fact that they're talking about putting nuclear weapons back in Cuba bring us right back to where we were, but there's no JFK there. So, um, you know, you need to remove the regime and, uh, the other major powers on earth need to know that the United States is back under some kind of, um, control, <laughs> uh, that is logical because, and constitutional, because this is, uh, in insanity, you know, this is my one disappointment with uh, the Kennedy campaign too, which is that they don't spend enough time railing against Biden and the destruction of the Biden regime on America. If they don't do that, they're not worth very much. You know, that's a fact. And they could do it. He could be the best. And, uh, you know, that's somebody who's taken on corporations, but he has not found any voice in taking on Biden. So that, for me, uh, is a shortfall, and maybe it's something that they can work on, because uh, without it, you know, he did a big long diatribe about how we shouldn't get involved in Middle Eastern wars and all these things. But he doesn't mention President Biden, who's doing it. So um, you have to do that, and uh, especially if you're Bobby, who who is, you know, uh, more, you know, he he's pretty transparent kind of guy. So we need that. So we can't leave Biden out of it. You know, Biden is destroying the country and you have to remove the Biden regime. So if you want to talk about deflecting World War III, you have to talk on that level. But does it come down to us in the final analysis, our own, uh, you know, where we're coming from spiritually? Absolutely. And um, I remember there's a Casey reading, uh, you were talking about one, but this one comes to mind where they did these world affairs meetings and uh, they had a, a little Congress there. It was 40 people. And it was before Pearl Harbor. And it said, can we avoid uh, 
you know, getting involved in this world war and having countries attack us. And he said, if the, the number of people in this room prayed for peace, then no country can invade the United States. 40 people. So that collective power, just like with the technology, very, very important. And with that, Miss Olivia, we are done. Okay. <laughs> very impressive tonight. Isn't that wonderful? That is the seal of the mystery play featuring the straighter device. Remember that. I think <laughs> Steiner was telling us, aha, uh -huh, it's X oriented. It's right in the heart. Um, as you got super chatters. I do. You're up. I have a bunch. Hold Go on. Let me get to the beginning. Okay. I would like to thank the Bikini Truther, Medley Childress, Les Scott, Thomas Ball, Fulcanelli, Black Tie, Jonathan McIntosh, Brian Berner, uh, Stephen, Jessica Rodriguez, Red Cap Goblin, Empire of Light, Helena Wilcox, uh, Apulia 2001, Wolfgang McCarthy, Jay Parsons, Charles Cheatham, uh, You're With Me Is Fun, Erica Swenson Elliott, Jackson, Terry Doherty, C.A. Be <laughs> Bever Forden, uh, Bo Krills, Channel the Heart, Barbara Joyce, Nathan Allen, Robert Scott, Doyle Wayne, uh, Thomas Ball, and A Beneficiary 1111. Thank you so much for your generous super chats. Wow, fantastic. You know, it makes all the difference. And uh, thank you for supporting the show to all our subscribers. We couldn't do it without you. And uh, having you, you know, support us through these. Uh, important report so we can really get down and focus on what's going on uh, makes all the difference. So thank you for being there. We'll be back with you next week. And um, we have some very exciting things. I mentioned February 23rd is a very special presentation. Make sure to mark it on your calendar. Fantastic interviews coming up and um, documentary activity events coming up later this spring as well. So make sure that you're on that newsletter list. And uh, behind all the work that we do here on the show, of course, great thanks to people like Rudolf Steiner, <laughs> who gave us that vision for this period and, um, you know, helping to open this back up. I think uh, there's a lot there for us to work with. So <laughs> we try to get it and put it in there. The last quote of the night, uh, I wanted to uh, give to Edgar Casey which where he says something interesting and this might become very important with some things i'm hearing about mexico are you ready it said how did the lost tribe reach this country and, you know we talked about this lost tribe of israel and he says in boats have the most important temples and pyramids been discovered those of the first civilization of Atlantis have been discovered and have not been opened, but their association, their connections are being replaced or attempting to be rebuilt. Many of the second or third civilization may never be discovered for these would destroy the present civilization in Mexico to uncover same. I was just reading about a massive uh, underground pyramid complex beneath Mexico City that they're trying to figure out, should we take the time to rip this up and out? But we may be looking there at a live time Casey prediction coming true again, reaching back across time, traveling and seeing with that remarkable vision. So this vision is there and it's available to all of us. And hopefully some of the things that we touched on tonight uh, really take us there. I'm going to do a couple of shout outs before we go. You, is Joseph part two out and available for subscribers? It is. Yeah. So uh, you can, uh, if you are a subscriber, you're going to have uh, this two hour episode, bonus episode with Dr. Joseph Farrell that we did all about UFO resonance, Tesla. Um, it's actually quite remarkable. And Keely comes up in that episode as well. So I highly recommend it. And there's a very bizarre section in there on the Confederacy, <laughs> which was a mind blower. But um, Yes, that episode uh, is available at darkjournalist.com. And um, what else have we got here? Mr. Black, <laughs> Rat Boy Genius. <laughs> great crowd out there tonight. Uh, I know Gigi was out there. It's great to see you. Uh, 
Planet Nine. Thank you both. All right, I forgot the technology. Gene Langley. Remember not, no, Ivan Langley, I'm sorry. Remember not to live in fear. Fear is the mind killer. There's no practical purpose for fear. One of the wonderful things that the Gurdjieff uh, teaching gives you is that all negative emotions are artificial. Uh, how about that? Planet Nine, thank you. Thomas Ball, great to see you out there. Melanie K. Neo Lemuria, there's a great name. Mm -hmm. Is it Neo Lemuria? Wow, great name. Fantastic name. Najat Madre, great to see you out there. <laughs> uh, Tina Boric, yes, please do. We're waiting for you. Resubscribe. Great night. Indeed. Don Newey, the American Civil War is worth a whole episode. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'm not even promoting a second one, so that makes it even better. Uh, Jimmy Lyle Kemener. Fantastic. Great. I know Kate's out there. That's great to have you with us. Havardian. Great show as always, DJ. Potent, indeed. That's what we need in 2024. Potency. <laughs> we love you. Oh, yes, we love you too. Bokrills, some great comments tonight. Let's see. That makes sense because every time I get mad or upset, I feel like I have to try to be mad. That's <laughs> That's good. It takes a lot to get me angry. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Never happens. Caritas Tarot. Here, here to potency. Everyone's on that. Look, bringing that potency home, that's really going to make all the difference this year. This is what it's about. There's going to be a lot of fluff stuff that is going to look like it's the real thing, but it's low potency. <laughs> High potency all the way. And uh, we have those high potency people as guests on the show. Thomas Ball, Glove Arm, Katie Cat, Golden Girl, Bardo, Rehoboth Farm. Fantastic being here with all of you. We will see you all. Loved every word, says CC. Thank you very much. We'll see you all next week. And, uh, you know, never let it be forgot once there was a Camelot. And there could be again, indeed, uh, this time around or some other time, but it's coming for sure. And it says end broadcast, but after all, it never really ends. It never really ends. Thank you very much. Uh, as far as uh, recommendations go, start your night off with Cosmic Memory by Rudolf Steiner. And um, the one I've been reading of late, it's hard to get and it is expensive, but maybe you can find it. Two Planets, very unusual. And it was Werner von Braun's favorite book, Loaded with esoteric themes including martians living in antarctica you can't beat that we'll see you all next week everyone thanks so much and uh, i think the psychic airships you know we're gonna learn more <laughs> thanks everyone talk god, soon god bless